Good afternoon and welcome to City and States Protecting New York Summit. I'm Zach Williams, Senior State Politics Reporter at City and State. We've got a great event uh, coming up this afternoon with multiple panels bringing together journalists, industry executives, public sector leaders, and academics to share ideas about how to discuss New York security strategy from keeping New Yorkers safe amid the ongoing pandemic to community policing and the tools needed to be recognized as a national leader in homeland security and emergency management. So much going on. Obviously, public safety was at the top of the agenda during the recent Democratic mayoral primary. So let's but before we jump right into the event, I would like to thank our wonderful sponsors that helped put on this event. They include CDW, Berkeley College, Celebrite, Data Miner, Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn, Corelight, Splunk, and Secure Worker Access Consortium. In lieu of audience applause, I'll just give a little clap from my apartment here. Thanks again to our great sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Um, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to go over a few logistics. One thing is the chat feature, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to uh, discuss everything going on in the event. And if you want to get some questions to our panelists at various times during the event, you just drop it right in that Q&A box that should be at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to fit it into the conversation as soon as we can. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to to introduce someone who really knows a thing or two about digital security and all these issues I just mentioned. And that is none other than Peter Bailey, Chief Strategy Officer at the AI driven event detector company, Data Miner. He's going to set the tone for us as we get jump into our discussions today. Peter. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Peter Bailey, Chief Strategy Officer of Data Miner, and it's a pleasure to be here. A uh, bit of background on Data Miner. Data Miner is the world's leading AI platform that detects the earliest signs of high impact events and emerging risks from publicly available data and information. Our product, First Alert for the public sector, allows our government clients to receive the earliest indications of breaking news so that they can respond quickly to public safety emergencies as they happen. Data Miner's company roots are right here in the heart of New York City with our office headquartered in Midtown Manhattan. And many of us have family, friends, colleagues working and living here as well. And that's why we are proud to support the NYPD for the sacrifices they make every day to protect New York City and its people. And we are grateful for their service. It's also why I'm honored to be here to introduce today's keynote speaker, First Deputy Commissioner, Benjamin Tucker. Deputy Commissioner Tucker, began his law enforcement career with the NYPD over 50 years ago as a police trainee. He became a police officer in 1972 and was promoted to sergeant in 1987. After serving 22 years with the NYPD, he continued his public service as a senior executive under Mayor Ed Koch. Several promotions later in 1995, he was appointed deputy director of operations in the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services at the U.S. Department of Justice. In 2009, he was nominated by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the United States Senate as the Deputy Director for State, Local, and Tribal Affairs within the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. In 2014, he returned to the NYPD as Deputy Commissioner of Training and was subsequently sworn in as the 43rd First Deputy Commissioner. Throughout his extensive career, Deputy Commissioner Tucker has seen how policing in New York and around the world has evolved. Today's law enforcement personnel must navigate modern threats and keep up to date with the latest technologies and methods of ever-changing communication to keep their city's infrastructure, people, and information safe. Tucker understands the impact modern technology has on the city and its potential to equip officers with the best real-time information so that they can act quickly and maintain peak performance. With his unique blend of law enforcement, criminal justice policy expertise, and academic experience, Tucker knows that keeping the city, its people, and its personnel safe is of utmost importance. So please join me in welcoming 
the first deputy commissioner of the city of New York, Benjamin Tucker. Good afternoon, Peter, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I'm honored to be back with you as your keynote speaker for City and States Protecting New York Summit. Uh, as I guess it was the last time we were here was October, and so it's good to be with you again. Uh, I want to thank uh, the city and state for the invitation, and of course, again, thank Peter uh, for his kind introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to offer my perspective uh, to uh, these important discussions among industry executives, public sector leaders, and academics. Sharing ideas on what New York's future should be and what it should look like couldn't be more timely considering the challenging times uh, of, uh, of the past year and a half. When I spoke to you last year, the NYPD was coming off uh, an extremely difficult spring and summer. There were three major damaging developments that I'll share with you. The ravages of COVID, including 19% uh, uniform sick rate at the department at its peak in April of 2020. The Floyd protests related looting in May and, uh, and related looting in May and June, uh, and uh, a steep uh, increases in shootings and murders over the summer and continuing into 2020, 2021. These factors contributed uh, a sense of, to a sense uh, that New York City was spiraling out of control. And uh, I don't think that was ever true, but it seemed, it seemed that, uh, that way to many people and, uh, and perhaps still does. Behind the scenes, there were other factors that deeply affected the NYPD and its efforts to control crime and disorder and our ability to keep people safe. Following George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis in May of uh, 2020, the attitude amongst the city's political class shifted from criticism of the police to outright hostility, it seemed, with many subscribing to the defund the police mantra. Since last spring, the department sustained cuts in our authorized uniform headcount from roughly 37,000 to about 35,860 people. As of today, because of class cancellations last spring, we are nearly 700 officers below the headcount and more than 1,800 below the former headcount. Given the challenges, of recruiting and the time it takes to train new recruits, it's going to take a while uh, for us to recover. We also sustained a severe cut in overtime. So we have fewer cops and fewer resources to fill the resulting staffing gaps. Moreover, even before Mr. Floyd's death, a series of laws and policy decisions at the state and local levels effectively undercut the time-honored police methods uh, for managing crime. These include bail reform that greatly increased the number of violent recidivist criminals who must be released pending trial, discovery reforms that require the release of the names of victims and witnesses in cases, as well as increasing the burden uh, on police and prosecutors to meet deadlines for turning over evidence to the defense. And the decision by prosecutors in several New York City counties to cease prosecution of lesser crimes, including the dismissal of most of the cases against people arrested for taking part in the extensive looting that occurred in May and June of 2020. These and, and other changes have made it much more difficult to suppress crime and violent spikes as the NYPD has, has done many times in the past. As I recounted for you last October, the NYPD has been proactive with respect to its police reform agenda. Since Bill Bratton came back in, in, as police commissioner in 2014, uh, we have pursued a vigorous reform agenda 
which has continued under Bratton's successors, Jimmy O'Neill, and now under Dermot Shea. One major thrust of our reforms was, greatly reduce, was to greatly reduce the NYPD's enforcement footprint while simultaneously cutting crime, and especially violent crime. Arrests, stops, and summonses are all down demonstrably. For example, in 2019, before the arrest declines caused by COVID in 2020, the NYPD arrested 148,000 fewer people of color than in 2013. This was the largest drop ever in NYP, NYPD enforcement. Yet, as a result of our more focused precision enforcement efforts, we also saw the biggest drop in violent crime since the, since the mid-1990s. The mid and during the past seven years, the city has recorded 70-year lows in murder, auto, auto theft, and burglary, as well as a 55-year low in robbery and a record lows and record lows in shootings. Another major thrust, thrust uh, of reform has been neighborhood policing, made possible by the most significant change in, in the patrol model since the advent of the 911 dispatch system in the mid-1960s. And when it comes to public safety, Citizens and cops are natural allies. They have a shared responsibility and neighborhood policing opens the door to closer collaboration, problem solving, as well as accountability. We are working more effectively with communities than ever at any time in our history. The NYPD also is engaging young people who are at risk as both victims and perpetrators of crime under a youth-focused initiative led by Commissioner Shea. Youth coordination officers have been designated in every precinct. They reach out to young people and their families and analyze and understand local youth crime problems and intervene with young chronic offenders to interrupt cycles of violence and retaliation. Connecting with young people, both to protect them and to prevent youth crime is the future of urban policing. And this is where the next increment of crime decline will likely come from. The NYPD has redoubled its commitment to our young people and our Deputy Commissioner for Community Partnerships, Chauncey Parker, is leading our Kids First initiative. Kids First is a consortium of programs that connect with kids before any potential involvement with the criminal justice system. Our aim is to broaden the kids' horizons by focusing on prevention and identifying resources, pathways, and opportunities that will help reach kids, help these kids reach their full potential. Let me give you some examples of these programs. In partnership with the Department of Youth and Development, uh, Youth and Community Development and the five district attorneys, Saturday Night Lights opens 100 gyms across our city each evening for free youth and, youth and sports engagement programs. In partnership with the New York City Police Foundation, the Options Program, helps build kids' decision-making skills and access career opportunities and internships. The NYPD has also partnered with the Department of Youth and Community Development for the Summer Youth Employment Program. Through a lottery system, the program provides paid summer employment in all, all of our precincts, housing service areas, and transit districts. The Field of Dreams program, which closely, working closely with, the, with NYCHA and other community leaders, has used asset forfeiture funds to renovate 15 NYCHA basketball courts across our city. Working with these programs and seeing the community turnout 
has been an inspiration to me and others to see the joy in the people's faces uh, from infants to octogenarians and to hear their voices is humbling. And it's great to hear a kid call a cop coach. These basketball courts are more than just playing surfaces. They're tangible symbols, in my view, of the community cop alliance that is so crucial uh, to our future success. All of these operational and community changes have been supported by extensive training and administrative reforms. With respect to use of force, the department has transformed our policy and we now track all uses of force, not just firearms and, dis and tasers or pepper spray, but supervisors and other investigators review every case to ensure that, force, that the force used was justified. Force allegations filed with the Civilian Complaint Review Board are down 46% since 2013. And use of force policy is part of my portfolio as, as the first dep, uh, deputy commissioner. So the NYPT takes responsibility for every time uh, an officer uh, puts hands on, on someone. And the way I look at it, if, situation, if a situation is serious enough uh, to require force, then it's serious enough to require a thorough investigation and thorough record keeping. The department has increased and enhanced its training to support neighborhood policing. Training now emphasizes communication and de-escalation, especially encounters with uh, emotionally disturbed people. We've also trained our officers in implicit bias and procedural justice, and we are currently instructing them in the duty to intervene in any police misconduct they may witness while having encounters on, on the streets. Our disciplinary system has been open to the public to open to public scrutiny. The discipline records of all uniform members of the service are now available online and working with a wide array of public uh, of police reform advocates, the department has published uh, an, a, an agreed upon matrix of presumptive penalties to clarify how and when penalties will be imposed. People want to know how officers are disciplined, and they should know. And we do a good job of correcting and re-educating officers and punishing them uh, when necessary. And now it's there for the public uh, to see for themselves. The department is uh, growing ever more diverse. And today, Hispanics and Blacks and Asians represent 54% of NYPD officers on the job and 57% of the patrol force. Women are 19% of, uh, represent 19% of uh, members uh, of the service. People of color have comprised 60 to 70% of recent police academy recruit classes, and women have been 24% of our new recruits. More recently, in March 2021, the council adopted a final police reform and reinvention collaborative plan. The city's reform imp implementation tracker demonstrates progress on 135 different commi uh, commitments made to both cops and our communities. Some of the highlights include the following. Expanding the department's customer service initiative to all precincts public housing service areas and transit districts. Providing for direct community participation in the selection of precinct commanders. Overhauling discretionary promotion system 
for uniform executives and seeking feedback uh, when developing new police policies through a public comment process. In all, the, the NYPD is nothing like the reform resistant institution pictured by our critics. We're actually on the leading edge of police reform in the nation, but we're not prepared to go along with reforms that we know will undermine our ability to effectively fight crime and keep our citizens safe. I said earlier that some violent crimes are up sharply. And I also said that bail reform and other measures were part of uh, the reason that that is occurring. Shootings and shooting victims have both risen by more than 100% in the past year. And these years coincide exactly with the first year and a half of bail reform driven by the shootings, murders is up 35, uh, 37%. Roughly 90% of the people arrested for illegal guns are now being released on their own recognizance or on nominal bail, uh, for nominal bail. Many other arrestees can no longer be remanded or held held on bail, including certain classes of both robbers and burglars. And so for those who believe these policies have no impact on, on violence, consider this. In 2020, 228 people arrested for shootings, including 71 homicides, had an open felony case prior to the shooting incident. And you have to ask yourself, why are these these people on the streets. The court closings caused by COVID and the consequent failure uh, to impanel grand juries have made matters worse. Our long-term cases against gangs and other violent actors were effectively stalled for six months and are still moving slowly. Working under these constraints, it is uh, very hard to keep, uh, keep the pressure on uh, the shooters. The NYPD supports bail reform, without a doubt. Uh, money should never be the determining factor in whether people are incarcerated. But judges have the power to remand violent and, re and repeat offenders, should have, the, should have the power to remand violent and, and, and repeat offenders. And New York is the only state in the union that does not allow judges to remand defendants who pose a danger to public safety. And any realistic bail reform, in my view, any realistic bail reform proposal should include this provision. Discovery rule changes are also undercutting crime fighting efforts. The rules require that prosecution turn over not only the names, but the addresses of victims and witnesses uh, to the defense attorney uh, for the accused uh, perpetrator. This has a chilling effect on the willingness of witnesses to come forward, to say the least. But the worst impacts of discovery reform may be yet to come. This law was largely written by the defense bar without meaningful consultation with law enforcement. So from our perspective, the requirements and the, dead, the deadline set by the law seem designed to trigger technical infractions. And these infractions can then be used to argue for dismissal of cases. Governor Cuomo suspended discovery requirements during COVID, but they are now back in force. And I would expect to see a number of solid cases against violent offenders dismissed on technical grounds in the coming months. As, as a matter of policy, the NYPD has reduced misdemeanor arrests by 72% since 2014. The department has supported the Criminal Justice Reform Act, which gave officers the option of issuing civil summonses 
for offenses that you that used to require a criminal summons or an arrest. Yet the department maintains that both misdemeanor arrests and criminal summonses are important components, certainly in controlling crime and addressing conditions that concern the citizens of New York City. In recent years, some of the city's district attorneys have decided to suspend prosecutions of many misdemeanors, including prosecutions for transit fare evasion. This has had the effect of undercutting the methods used by the police to suppress more serious crime and maintain public order. These policies benefit first-time offenders, protecting them from criminal justice consequences. But they also benefit the drivers of crime and limit the police capacity to intervene with, intervene with and disrupt uh, their activities. In effect, the, they undermine the department's neighborhood policing approach, which seeks to involve police officers in active problem solving at the neighborhood level. Instead of acting unilaterally to establish no prosecution policies for misdemeanors, prosecutors should collaborate with the police to establish workable policies that maintain the deterrent effect of laws governing lesser crimes. In any discussion of crime and its impacts, it should be noted that violent crimes in New York City are largely directed at our Black and Hispanic populations. Last year, 91% of murder victims and 75% of rape victims and 70% of robbery victims were Black or Hispanic. Nearly 97% of our shooting victims were Black or Hispanic. And surely we owe these victims and the victims of crimes in the future our best efforts to deter, control, and punish violent crime. And when well-meaning efforts to inform or reform the criminal justice system have a net effect of protecting criminals and endangering victims, then these reforms have gone too far. The NYPD has made a major good faith effort to increase the fundamental fairness of policing in New York City. And we have over the several years now without sacrificing its effectiveness. Safe and fair has been our motto. A city that is not safe can never be fair to victims of crime. I could go on and take up the entire session speaking uh, to our efforts at reducing crime and the new programs we have instituted for our kids. I hope I've, I've given you a comprehensive picture uh, where we are as an agency, both our challenges, as well as our commitment to communities that we serve. And I hope that this information will inform or provide some context for you as you con con convene your, your sessions later today. And so uh, thank you once again for the opportunity to speak uh, to such an esteemed group. And, and it's been an honor for me to address you uh, again uh, as part of the Protecting New York Summit uh, for the second time. Uh, we certainly here at the department appreciate your support. Uh, and as you move uh, to your panel's discussion, know that this department is, is, remains unwavering in our commitment to keep New York City safe. Thanks again. Thank you so much, uh, First Deputy Commissioner. That was really great. Uh, again, that was Benjamin Tucker, First Deputy Commissioner for the NYPD. Uh, he seems to know a thing or two. It's like he does this for a living or something, right? Uh, that was a great crash course in where uh, the NYPD is right now on all these different public safety issues. Thanks again, and we hope we'll see you in person maybe next year at our next uh, public safety. Uh, uh, I'd love to join you. Thank you. Sweet. Thanks so much again. You have a great day. And now we're, we're 
you know, there's been so much talk about what infrastructure is. And obviously it's really important for how New Yorkers live and just how society functions. And it could be anything from a bridge to the internet we use right here to have this great event. Um, and obviously public safety uh, can really be jeopardized uh, by a lack of security around our infrastructure itself, whatever it is. So let's dissect exactly what that means. What does it mean to protect New York's infrastructure we got a heavy hitter uh, colleague of mine, Annie McDonough, tech and policy reporter to moderate our next discussion on this very topic. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. Annie? Thanks very much, Zach. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Annie McDonough, as Zach mentioned, city, city and state's tech and policy reporter. Very excited to moderate this panel on protecting New York's infrastructure. As Zach intimated, that's of course a wide ranging topic and there's a lot to get to. So I won't waste too much time before starting off. I'll just remind the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will try to leave a few minutes at the end to get to those. We have a great panel here today. Here today. Um, I wanna start tackling this massive question of how to protect New York's infrastructure, taking a look at national security. We're coming up on the anniversary of the terrorist attacks on September 11th and the landscape of threats has obviously changed and evolved since then. I wanna start out by asking panelists, what are the security threats that New York is focused on or perhaps should be most focused on right now? Uh, maybe we can just go around and I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves as you answer. And I'll let uh, a volunteer start here, whoever would like to start. I'll be fine to go. Uh, Roger Perino, the director at the uh, Port Authority in New York and New Jersey. Uh, 20 years uh, uh, have gone by since the uh, since the, the terrorist attack, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon uh, and the uh, plane that went down in Pennsylvania. Um, terrorism is still an issue. The tactics may change. The reasons for the terrorism's change uh, but it all comes down to protecting the people of the of New York and New Jersey and the uh, protecting the infrastructure. So uh, we weren't familiar with uh, the vehicle rammings 20 years ago. We weren't familiar with drone issues, um, but we are today. Uh, uh, firearms has always been an issue, but now you have uh, certain terrorist groups pushing for bladed weapons. Uh, that becomes an issue. And then, of course, uh, 20 years ago, we were very concerned about foreign terrorism, foreign attacks, and now uh, there's, there's a big reason to be concerned about domestic terrorism and the uh, that uh, which that brings to the table. All right, thank you. Um, Commissioner Murphy, are you on? Uh, maybe we can go to you next. Sure. So uh, Pat Murphy, Commissioner of Homeland Security and Emergency Services for the state of New York. Um, uh, I'm into my third year here with uh, with New York, but uh, not a stranger previous uh, to this. Um, back in uh, 2010 to 2016, uh, I was responsible for the National Guard and uh, military forces of New York and then went down to the Pentagon for three years before retiring. Um, you know, when I, when you, when you ask about the, the threats to New York, uh, um, Rogers really uh, kind of touched on, on the, uh, on what we're really looking at. And I mean, we're, we're concerned about foreign actors that would do us harm in New York. Uh, we track uh, what uh, we can uh, in the environments that we have and what we, uh, discuss in a, in a number of forums uh, what what that threat would look like to us. And, uh, and many times uh, that is who we're tracking uh, for uh, the threat here. But more importantly, and, uh, and probably uh, more serious to us are, are independent actors or uh, extremist groups uh, that are domestic. And we have a number of those that uh, that are viewed in New York itself. I think uh, if you look at uh, January 6th uh, at the White House and you look at those that were uh, 
uh, have been uh, charged uh, in, uh, in what looks like an insurrection. Uh, you'll see that there's a number of those that came out of New York. Uh, and so uh, they may have taken action in, in DC, but we're also worried about what happens in New York with those. So that domestic violent extremist is, uh, is somebody that we uh, pay a lot of attention to as we go forward as well. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and turn it to someone else. Hi, Pat Warren here. Um, I'm the uh, Chief Safety and Security at uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, MTA, in the city. I like uh, the commissioner. I've been here coming on three years, and I'm also not a stranger to um, uh, work uh, in security um, uh, previous life. Um, the, the one area that I would uh, that we do focus on and that hasn't been mentioned yet um, is this idea of active shooters. If you, you know, if we looked across the nation, um, probably the largest challenges that we've had uh, in terms of security uh, shortfalls have been, have been shootings. And, and so um, while uh, hardening the targets, which was brought up about, you know, trucks and other things trying to come into uh, some of our spaces, um, trying to make sure that we have we're protected, um, we have systems to detect uh, active shooter weapons and the like um, is a big part of also what we're doing right now. Jump in there right there after uh, Mr. Uh, Warren. Gary Kulish, Berkeley College. I'm the chair of Justice Studies and National Security within the School of Professional Studies. Um, it's important to add to what you just said about active shooters there. And within the 18, past 18 months, we've seen the role of a local police officer in this country changed dramatically with uh, the pandemic and social movements and threat of uh, terrorism and, and things that could arise anywhere within the country at any time um, based on a social media post or a, a news news crew being uh, present at a certain time. Um, you know, something as the murder of George Floyd, you know, made international and every local police department had to begin to take action, prepare for things that may occur in their, their town. And as the deputy commissioner briefly said, it's a shared responsibility um, within the community, within the you know, public and private sector. Um, and that's where you know, public-private partnerships come greatly into play, which we'll probably discuss more on. Thank you. And last up, we have uh, Daniel Kranz. That was all very well said. And I think the only thing that I can add that's constructive is, is to keep in mind that an actual criminal or terrorist event is often preceded by surveillance. And it's very important that we understand who people are and whether or not they belong at various sites. Some of these sites are public or have public facing areas. Some of them do not. And to speak to what Gary just mentioned, I think it's really important that everybody work together. And I think I'm probably moving your discussion along uh, maybe prematurely, but everybody work together to, to manage this threat uh, versus trying to take it on on their own as, as individual organizations, agencies, and, and even the big private corporations that are, are critical to New York's infrastructure. I do want to talk about that next. Um, Daniel and Gary, what you were both uh, just talking about. Obviously, communication and collaboration is essential in managing these risks. It was true on September 11th, arguably true on January 6th as well. Um, how do we see security collaboration happening in New York, whether that is public-private partnerships or even at a simpler level, coordination among government agencies? Are there any sort of model examples to point to where this is working well so far? Well, I can certainly speak to the public-private partnerships and, and how well it works. Um, <clears throat> we established our program over 14 years ago uh, under the leadership and and supervision and continuing oversight of the Port Authority. And the purpose of, of the program was really to bring together all the stakeholders that, uh, that, that value the safety and security of the critical infrastructure in, in, in New York and around the country. So for example, um, it's very important that the contracting community, the consulting and vendor community uh, work within certain guidelines and that those guidelines or that standard of care, if you will, is set at a high level to assure the effectiveness of a program and that those individuals, if they're screened at one place to work for the Port Authority at World Trade, 
when they enter um, another uh, high value target, such as the financial industry and the, and, the, and the infrastructure throughout New York and the financial industry, that there's not a duplication of effort that makes it grossly inefficient. So we're looking uh, to bring people together and establish that high level of, of professionalism uh, in the work that we do uh, under standards that uh, meet the best practices that have been developed over the last two decades since 9-11. Uh, and we do that in an efficient way um, so that everybody throughout the region can benefit from that effort, not just an individual agency. Anyone else like to jump in? Maybe Roger, from the other end of that uh, partnership, I mean, from your perspective, what is the importance of working uh, with, with outside groups? So uh, I would stress the uh, intergovernmental part. So working with uh, other state agencies, city agencies, federal agencies. So the Port Authority Police are members of the uh, terrorist task force with the NYPD, with the New Jersey State Police, with the, uh, with the New York State Police. And the sharing of information through fusion centers, the sharing of information that uh, we get with the uh, I have an intelligence team and my, one of my analysts works with the, within the NYPD so that uh, we're constantly sharing information and sharing thoughts. And the key is to always look for trends and patterns and communicate them because uh, one may be seeing something or you may be seeing one thing, I may say another, and then we put it together and it's a, pet, a pattern or a trend. I would, uh, oh, go ahead, Pat. Go ahead, Pat. I'll, I'll just say that, um... Uh, similar to the Port Authority with, uh, with the, the MTA, it, it's, it's a collision of jurisdictions. Um, we are, in our particular case, we not only run across, uh, you know, multiple, all the boroughs inside of the city, uh, and well as we collide with Amtrak, the police, we collide with the Port Authority, as well as all the counties and city um, jurisdictions that are up and down um, Long Island and up into Connecticut and, and the Hudson Valley. And um, it is really important to, to do just what you've described and that is to have systems and processes where that we work together and we, and we communicate well. And um, you just heard a couple of infusion centers type of work, but I, I will tell you that one of the biggest things we do is, is truly every event that's out there that happens every day, whether it's a storm, whether it's a parade, whether it's a riot, whether uh, it's some other kind of, uh, of event that's out there, we continue to, to um, all join in at those particular points of, uh, of uh, location and, and work together to, to solve problems and make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes. Certainly communication systems that, that talk to one another are important. Leadership uh, having uh, constant uh, uh, meetings and, and 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 kind of coordination events throughout the year, and then that just boots on the ground kind of uh, familiarity you get from all these other events. Okay, Commissioner. So uh, what I thought I'd do is just maybe give you a uh, practical example of of what we do in New York uh, in terms of trying to keep New Yorkers safe, and and uh, uh, I'm not. I can't take any credit for this when Roger Perino was in the position that I'm in and uh, he really grew this uh, program, but it's the red teaming effort that we have. It wraps around, see something, say something. And uh, we have a team that goes out and does education. And it's uh, it's a partnership with the, the 16 counterterrorism zones that are established uh, throughout the state. Uh, members of those uh, those counterterrorism zones are primarily, uh, but not exclusively, to the law enforcement or law enforcement supporting agencies. Um, and so we go into the community big box stores or uh, other uh, vendors that would have uh, resources that they're selling that uh, could be used as, for example, bomb making material or something like that. Uh, we go in and, and educate uh, those staffs, those, uh, those businesses, uh, their employees on what to look for, what is suspicious, what is reportable. And then once that education piece is complete, we partner with that uh, private uh, business uh, and uh, the local law enforcement and go back out and test it by going in where, where we would do it overtly in the education, we would go in more covertly uh, uh, and test whether uh, those items are reported. And 
you know, to the to the credit of the teams that are out there working on that right now, um, things had slowed down through the pandemic because of the contacts and the businesses being in reduced configuration. But again, it's uh, it's spun up uh, in 2018. And Roger, you can correct me because you were uh, part of these numbers. I think uh, 2018 and 2019 there were a thousand contacts each year, just over a thousand contacts uh, in all, uh, across all of the, the counties and in the 16 counterterrorism zones across the state. And so uh, I, when we talk about partnerships, I think that's a, a prime example of uh, public private to make uh, New Yorkers safe, uh, as well as our law enforcement uh, partners throughout the state. Maybe Roger, if you have anything you want to add to that one, I think it's a, it's a good, it's a model, and it's something that other states are trying to uh, emulate as well. So, if if you like, Pat, I can add a little bit to it. So, the one thing that we had uh, FBI support, state police support, and then all the local uh, police departments. Every time you went anywhere, so that was really phenomenal. And at first, people were rejecting it because they thought it was going to be an aha. You know, we caught you, you didn't do this or that. And it's completely the opposite. Very heavy on the educational piece, as Commissioner Murphy said. And I think uh, that's uh, that's the key. I'm curious, is there some sort of penalty for, uh, you know, if a private business does not report those items? No, that's absolutely not. I'm sorry, no. you should answer that. No, there is there is no penalty. It, the uh, It's all about education and going back and, and uh, revisiting the uh, the in the business that we're working with, um, typically we get the management's attention uh, pretty quickly once uh, they've invested in the education for their employees, and then the employees don't follow through. Uh, but there's no no punitive uh, uh, action taken uh, in the test, but uh, so noted and provided feedback, and over time. Uh, our goal is to continue to improve the reporting uh, through the see something, say something, or the tip lines uh, as we move forward. Got it. Gary, I want to hear from you on this as well. Sure, I was going to jump in based on what uh, Roger and Patrick both said. Um, education is, is key. You get the component there, not just within the, the public and private sector, but also in academia. Um, prior to being at Berkeley College, I was with the Secret Service and I was working there on 9-11, as many of these gentlemen were as, as well. Um, it's So prior to the pandemic, Berkeley uh, and myself took, met with the faculty in our Justice Advisory Board and created uh, concentrations within critical infrastructure and public-private partnerships. So you can get a degree in national security and also specialize in public-private partnerships or intelligence. Uh, critical infrastructure is one of our, which is what we're discussing here with city and state. And it's important that a lot of the individuals that get a degree not only are prepared academically, but they know what's going to happen, or what's going to be like moving into a lot of these agencies and organizations that are with us today, uh, because they're going to have to hit the ground running, for lack of a better term. They're going to have to know these things. Um, as the role of these positions changed, um, as I mentioned with the role of local police officers in this country, you know, things are, the threats are constantly evolving. And I can't stress, just like the commissioner mentioned about education. Do you have, I'm curious if you've, you know, since instituting those um, concentrations, see an increase in, in students taking those up? There, there is, and actually a lot of the individuals and students that were, were coming to, to Berkeley and in my class and, and many classes, they, they wanted to go in law enforcement. They didn't really know what they wanted to, to do in law enforcement, um, or they changed after taking a, a number of semesters, they say, you know what, I, I see, I want to go into Office of Emergency Management. I want to be a first responder, not necessarily carry a firearm legally or make arrests, but I really want to be available for public emergencies, you know, uh, climate change, you know, natural disasters, things, you know, in New Jersey, Hurricane Sandy, uh, obviously the things that are, are the uh, threats are evolving and they're also intensifying, which I'm sure we'll, we'll speak of with critical infrastructure. We're not, the system is, is outdated and it needs to be updated quickly because uh, we can only do so much with education and the agencies and the practitioners can only do so much with what they have. You know, we, we have to update an aging uh, critical infrastructure system. 
I mean, those are um, some really good examples you just mentioned, all of you there. Um, I imagine though that there's always room for improvement, always uh, room to encourage more collaboration. And I'm curious if you can speak to any remaining challenges that stand in the way of that, whether that's ensuring secure information sharing, whether that's sort of dealing with the um, collision of jurisdictions as you mentioned, Pat Warren, um, you know, what are the uh, remaining challenges to working together within the public sector, between the public and private sector even, um, you know, to manage these security risks? I'll let anyone who can weigh in there start. I'll, I'll start off and just say um, one a challenge, and it's, it's both a blessing and a, and a problem, a challenge is, is social media in some regards. Social media is a great tool to get information out uh, and, it, and it goes everywhere and it certainly is picked up by the different um, security organizations. Um, but it also um, contributes to uh, people flocking to that particular site when we don't really want them to go there or, uh, or, or inappropriate or false uh, information going out um, and, and then uh, can um, you know, flame the, the fire um, on issues from partial information. Whether so, so there's a challenge in managing our reaction to uh, social media and using, you, you know, to its value and to its, um, uh, you know, and to its, its, its challenges or its problems, as you want to say. And then just, I'll say this, and I'm sure others have other things to say, but just about um, New York City in particular is that, that, you know, we've got great, you know, we've got great systems to communicate. We can prove them all the time. They're largely interoperable, but the actual physical movement often within the city is a huge challenge. It's congested at times. Um, it's confusing and, and working through how to make sure you have your forces in the appropriate locations to su support problems that may or may not come up. Um, work with one another, you, you know, share, you know, somebody else's forces may be nearby, make sure, you know, and they can support uh, a mission where you, that, that you don't have your forces in place for a kind of idea. So that's an area that, that always needs some, some work right now, a couple areas. So I, I also would add that uh, we talked a lot about law enforcement talking and the private uh, partnership with, uh, but the one thing that has always been a struggle since 20 years ago is uh, sharing from the intelligence division and the intelligence community rather, I'm sorry, and the intelligence community able to break their information down and share it with law enforcement in a way that's meaningful and law enforcement can use it. So that's a constant struggle. And it's been, uh, I think, uh, the Department of Homeland Security does a very good job. The FBI has improved greatly on, on sharing information that way. Uh, and I think that's that's one of the struggles and we have to remember that September 11th was caused because of the intelligence it wasn't caused it, it came to being because the intelligence community in itself wasn't sharing. I'd like to add to that as well and in, in, in kind of a generic standpoint, you know we I think most if not all of us have come through public safety backgrounds and public safety traditionally has always been a more of a response oriented, recovery oriented operation, uh, tactically speaking. And I think that one of the things that we can all do better is shift more towards prevention and the implementation of not only information sharing, but uh, programs that are geared specifically to uh, mitigating risk, uh, particularly inside threats uh, prior to, to an event rather than in response to an event. Any final thoughts before we move on here? If not, um, I wanna to get to our, our next topic, but um, I know I said I would save audience questions for the end, but there's one that came up uh, that I want to address now because it's on topic. Um, we have an, an audience question that reads, what methods and technologies are you using to empower the community to actively and anonymously participate in the See Something, Say Something initiative? How can New Yorkers uh, know how to best take, um, take advantage of this initiative, I suppose? Maybe Commissioner Murphy, uh, yeah. sorry. Okay, so, uh, you know, unfortunately it's not high technology. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really grassroots uh, kind of work that's done every day. And uh, we work it through um, 
information that we have printed up, uh, postings. Uh, you, you can't hardly get on an Amtrak train or even uh, through the uh, uh, any of the rail systems without seeing a, a, uh, a phone number that would provide uh, access to a tip line, uh, even calling in uh, tips um, in an emergency uh, uh, type line. Uh, works because it gets routed back to uh, somebody that will uh, record it and take action on it. But it, it's, it, it's really not high technology. It's, uh, we can, they can go in and, and uh, the, most of the tips that, uh, that we look at, not all, I shouldn't say most, but there are many tips that uh, when we see the report, uh, it, it literally says anonymous tip from uh, individual, this date, this time, and uh, what action is uh, is taken to investigate or to take a look at those things, but it's uh, but they truly are anonymous when they're when they're coming in. If somebody wants to be anonymous, if they want to follow up, then it's easy enough to get follow up as well. But it's it's really low tech. Uh, make a phone call or uh, a computer entry uh, to do that, and uh, and I think that's probably the from our perspective. Uh, for what we're responsible for, uh, that's what we're looking at. So, I mean, others may have uh, other opinions of that. Anything else? I mean, th thank you. That I think um, addresses the question pretty well. Um, I there's a lot to talk about here on this topic, but I want to move on to um, different kind of uh, lens for pr protecting our infrastructure. Seems like in the last few weeks, months, years, even, we've gotten some pretty good previews of what risks climate change and extreme weather pose to our physical infrastructure, our roads, our tunnels, and so on. Uh, we've seen some action, obviously, since Hurricane Sandy, but when it comes to these kinds of disasters and more frequent extreme weather events, what are the most urgent uh, threats to infrastructure that you're dealing with, that you're looking at, and what's being done to manage those threats right now? I'll start with uh, MTA. Um, so, you know, there's there's sort of the winter weather th threat, but in, so far in New York and particularly New York City, those things are fairly manageable. It's more it's more the summer kinds of threats where rain, flooding, um, and of course wind and, and, and tropical storms, hurricanes, and that kind of uh, affect rising water kind of kind of issues um, begin to. Uh, our system, which has lots of either rail track and, and low level areas or subways underground or, or, or the like. Um, and so since, since Sandy, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of work done to um, put in um, uh, covers on vents and hatches on tunnels and uh, uh, barriers for buildings and, and the basements and the, and the like to try to keep um, uh, you know, bay water and, and it from having a, uh, be a bigger problem. Uh, also, like moving, uh, having extra generators moving them to higher ground so they're not subject to water and, and issues like that. So that's sort of immediate response to those those kinds of challenges. But they're not going to solve a long-term challenge of the water rising necessarily, uh, which is a bigger issue that, that, uh, that quite frankly, that we we're, we we are not we're not addressing at this particular point in time. But it's something that's sort of in the back of your mind. Um, so so uh, weather remains a big a big issue and and um, it is, you're not always, and the other challenge of it is you don't always quite know where it's gonna land within within our environment. You, uh, because of the way this whole region is um, is configured, you know, you could have a, a storm surge issue on one one bank of one island and not have it in another location kind of idea. And so you're always trying to, to uh, do your best to put it in the right place. There are still places that, um, that uh, are, probably now more vulnerable than others um, since we've gotten the low hanging fruit, but there's still some work to be done. I mean, obviously for those of us based in New York, uh, in New York City rather, um, a lot of the focus has been on rising sea levels oh. on coastal resiliency, um, but extreme weather is of course going to affect the whole state in different ways. Um, Commissioner Murphy, I'm wondering if you can sort of address, you know, from a statewide perspective, the broader landscape for uh, weather and natural disaster threats, uh, what that looks like across the state, and what uh, you know different approaches different regions are taking. 
Yeah. So let me try a, a couple things with you to begin with. First of all, when we talk about uh, um, climate change and where we're going with uh, protecting infrastructure and that type of thing, uh, it's important to remember that when we do have uh, a disaster declared, there are a number of dollars that come with those uh, disasters that we can use for mitigation. Uh, and, and, you know, most of in the past, it was build back to what you had before. And uh, in, in more recent times, that's really taken on a new face in that um, building back to what you had before doesn't re reduce the risk or the vulnerability of that infrastructure being damaged again. And so with these, uh, with these dollars that come in uh, for uh, projects, there are dollars that are associated with uh, mitigation. And, and each one of these disasters uh, has improved different pieces of infrastructure. I'll use a, a, uh, one of the very large projects on Long Island after uh, Sandy came through, which is still being built out now, um, is uh, sewage treatment so that uh, our environment is protected, um, the sewage plant doesn't go underwater again, uh, and so there's a barrier built up around it. The infrastructure is built up off of, uh, at a higher elevation. Uh, so that's, that's public infrastructure that's being uh, funded and improved for the climate change that we see to, to mitigate that risk that we would see otherwise. We also see uh, regulations being put in place about building back homes and, uh, and private businesses where you see um, water levels, uh, water table levels and water levels uh, rising. We're, we have uh, building codes now where if you're building back, you have to build at a certain elevation and, uh, and other criteria. But that's not uh, just specific to sandy impacted uh, areas like Long Island. Uh, what's happened to us now uh, in 2017, uh, again, Roger can relate to this one, and 2019, where we spent most of our, our summer up on Lake Ontario, uh, 430 miles of, of, of shoreline that's being eaten away by higher water levels that, uh, that are coming out of Lake Erie into Lake Ontario, and just the amount of infrastructure that's lost. And, oh, by the way, we, we happen to put a lot of that public infrastructure uh, in, in some proximity to the lower ground a lot of times. And so uh, in, these, in using these mitigation dollars that we have and um, another program that's going on specifically from the state is called uh, a ready program. And that ready program is uh, building back uh, uh, with more resist in more resilient ways. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to or whoever else is um, uh, the uh, BRIC program, the Building uh, Resilient uh, Infrastructure and Communities, uh, is where a lot of the money's coming from. The uh, administration has committed uh, a huge uh, amount of uh, money to this. It's doubled uh, for this next year in uh, grants. Uh, the uh, there was about 450 million that was used. Uh, this, pr this previous round of grants, uh, New York picked up about 29 uh, million plus for those uh, projects, but uh, we see that increasing over the next uh, couple of years as well. And again, that's all about building back in a more resilient way based on much of what we see in climate change. Roger, it sounds like you were uh, working on that Lake Ontario project as well. Oh yes. The, the <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, fond memories, it sounds like. That's exactly right. Fond memories, because it was the first time we were dealing with it. So it was something different than what we're used to. We're used to the tidal surge. We're used to precipitation. Yet this was just a, a, a death by a thousand cuts. And um, But I think uh, what I wasn't able to accomplish, I think Pat was able to accomplish. Is this Is preparation for these kinds of risks an area where... Uh, we see a large amount of collaboration uh, between agencies or even public-private partnerships. Is this another area where there, where those types of uh, partnerships are going to be important to 
to mitigating the, these risks. Sure, but you know what becomes important too is leaning on the education community of uh, getting universities that gives to have some studies, get you information on how precipitation is moving, how the climate is moving, how tornadoes are now moving east and uh, and get their view on things that are apolitical and you can more uh, put decide where your resources are going to go and what what's doable. And Gary, I don't know if it's something that you uh, focus on in Berkeley, but but do you, is that something that's happening? Do you think it has? Um, you know, we're we're a career college. We're really interested in getting in that into the career, so we're not a research research based institution. But that doesn't say that uh, our students in the community hasn't uh, it, they're battle tested and they've become more resilient. The agencies that are here with us today are very good at what they do with preparedness and mitigation, and, and they were talking about the budgets and the funding. But you know, a lot of the, the students. Um, especially New Yorkers in general, are, have been through a lot in the last 20 years. Um, and as the threats and everything tends to intensify, a lot of the students and a lot of the communities have also learned from previous um, experiences and they're not as reliant. And again, the government and the agencies at every level are doing a great job, but the communities themselves are, are, have learned and become more resilient and less, I don't wanna say less dependent on government, but they've been more proactive in taking their own mitigation and preparedness into their own hands instead of relaying or relying on the government rather, you know, gassing up their vehicle before a shortage happens or before a storm comes, you know, making sure that every uh, mobile device is fully charged before something may happen. Um, you know, reaching out to, you know, using social media as the other panelists discussed, using social media as a positive source of communication if things happen that they can communicate with one another or get the, the message out and share um, and also working closer with and, and befriending their neighbor to um, be more reliant on a community bef and, and getting a handle on the issue before government actually is on the scene. Got it, got it. We have um, about 10 minutes left here on the panel. I just want to send a reminder for the audience. If you have any questions, feel, please feel free to put those in the box. I see a few uh, popping up, including um, one about uh, cyber threats. And that is an issue that I want to get to with all of you. Obviously, we've seen massive ransomware breaches, even spyware operations recently. Um, you know, cyber warfare is a threat to federal, state, local governments, private institutions, and of course, our infrastructure, the Colonial Pipeline hack being a good example of that. Um, to those of you focus on national security, to what extent has cyber security become as much of a consideration as other kinds of security in the work that you do? Um, and can you point to any examples of, of prevention work that you're doing in the cyberspace? I'll let whoever wants to start there. I guess I'll take the lead as the tech guy on this. <laughs> um, you know, cybersecurity is by, is most definitely an, an incredibly important thing as, as attack vectors have focused on, on physical infrastructure systems. And, and unfortunately it's, it's difficult to to work together beyond academia to understand those threats and how to mitigate those threats. But it's, it's, it's very important that not only government, but private industry take that threat seriously as, as so much of our critical infrastructure is dependent on those private companies to remain secure, as we saw in the, in the, in the pipeline ransomware and, and the, the, the cascading effect of that. So, you know, technology is something that you know, you have to take in-house uh, that responsibility in-house doesn't mean you necessarily perform it in-house. Um, in fact, just today we we we're we're watching an incident um, that's affecting everybody nationally through uh, the the degra degraded service of Amazon Web Services, and it's one of the reasons that um, I've literally fought with my own technology people for two decades now to to retain the autonomy that we have in serving our, our systems and that we don't use those outside managed services for that exact reason, that, that you're more vulnerable to somebody else's uh, failure. Um, so critical systems like ours that are, that are involved in, in safety and security and in and, and operations, uh, you really have to focus on assuring that they're secure uh, and that they're always available. I'll comment um, again with the MTA, and, and while um, you know, cybersecurity of uh, securing our data is, is really important, um, 
towards the the idea of, of providing service. Um, a couple of things, you know, certainly our signaling systems and those things that move trains and to some uh, extent um, uh, buses, um, you know, are are really really important. And you know, the, if there's a good news, it's that 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 if for some reason they get hacked and, and, and there's damage to them, they no one should get hurt because there's fail safes to shut things down, but it will disrupt service significantly, which when you're in an environment um, such as we have in New York and you gotta get people back and forth to, to work and their jobs and you're just in the hub for, for all kinds of movement, it's really important to the economy and to security and safety uh, to keep things moving. Um, so a couple of things that were, you know, in particular, looking at right now, so one of them is is uh, moving away from some of the um, sort of on-site uh, storage systems um, for information and whatnot, and moving stuff up into the cloud, which which does two things. One, um, usually that those uh, systems in the cloud are much more protected, uh, generally speaking, because of how that operates and all the effort, effort that goes into it. Plus, from a weather sense, it, it, it protects us from you know, damage from weather that might might occur. So it's important to move stuff that way. The second thing is, is there's a lot of, you know, our system was built a long time ago and, and it's uh, sort of been clued together, um, you know, like Frankenstein over the years. And, and so we have to, um, we, are, we are spending a lot of energy looking at those older systems out there that are running our operations and slowly, um, uh, uh, you know, I say slowly, uh, as aggressively as we can actually, um, swapping them out for systems that are much more um, uh, up-to-date, modern, and uh, and protect um, that service uh, so that we can continue to move. Cyber's uh, cyber's interesting because you're talking about a criminal element that we have to deal with, but now we're, we're also talking about state-sponsored cyber issues. Um, on July 19th, the White House put out a warning on uh, China and then specifically as it relates to cyber and infrastructure. Um, I think you'll find that uh, well, in ransomware, they said was a 300% increase in 2020. And I think a 30% repeat. So if you've already been a victim, they already know you're weak and they hit you again. Um, but I think the bigger difference is the state sponsored. I think your next big war will be, have a lot of cyber part, part in it. Um, shutting down a bridge, uh, shutting off the lights, getting rid of a, a electric opening of a dam, closing of a dam when it's supposed to be open, just doing the opposite to cause disruption, interfering with uh, uh, the banking system, finances, everything else. I think we have a lot to learn. And this is a field that, you know, everyone on this panel was somewhere either in the military or in law enforcement or the secret service. And, but cyber, cyber comes from technical experts and then we have to bring them in and become security and get security minded. And it becomes a real challenge for all of us. Wonder if you think that um, since seeing that increase and since maybe just an increased awareness um, in the national security space about uh, how easily cyber threats sort of weave into the broader security threats, whether becoming security minded is something that um, we're getting better at that we're seeing more awareness of the need to start, um, you know, building those defenses. So I, I think we are, but every time you build a defense, there's a new game that you have to be. So you have to be on top of this and then you have to, and chances are your organization, whether it's private or government, doesn't have the technology or the knowledge to do this. So you're bringing in other people to do it. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a constant game of um, whack-a-mole. But um, it has to be done, and I think we're all becoming much more aware of it. And I think the pipeline was a big uh, uh, eye opener for all of us. We have Roger brings up a. I'm sorry, Annie. No, please go ahead. I was going to say Roger brings up a, a great point, and it's not just the, the government entities and, and state agencies. Um, you know, they don't usually play, and I don't want to speak for them, but they don't usually go on the offensive. So we're dealing with they're dealing with an adversary that is always on the offensive, and they don't have to worry about putting up a good defense because they're just on offense. And then the same the same thing with cyber. It's not just a really elaborate pipeline attack. It's also misinformation and use of social media for, uh, you know, whether it be ill-gotten gains or, or for spreading fake news or putting out information for, for mass gatherings, such as, you know, I hate to bring up, the, you know, the capital, um, you know, situation. 
but you know, social media was that platform was used, and you know, people. It sounds very parochial, but people can you know see something, say something. If you see a lot of chatter, which the government is obviously monitoring, but people also can play a role in seeing that there's a lot of information or a lot of people. Um, for example, a lot of the airlines were seeing that a lot of people were, were, were buying tickets to the D.C. area prior to that event. And that's something that all the agencies and the federal government are going to learn from and, and, and being researched as we speak. But, you know, it's something as parochial as just people using social media for cyber uh, concerns as, as, as well for, for misinformation, not just hacking. Um. We have we have a few minutes left, and I want to um, just sort of get one last question in uh, before we wrap up. Reflecting really on all the all the different sort of uh, ways of thinking about infrastructure that we've discussed today, all of these prevention and risk management efforts that we're talking about, of course, demand a large amount of resources. To what extent is funding uh, for these for these efforts a remaining issue? Whether we're talking about terrorism threats, cyber vulnerabilities, or, or climate resilience? I think the cost of these events is, <clears throat> can, has proven to be potentially extraordinary. And I think one of the key elements of public-private partnerships is that the government is not necessarily funding the cure-all for everybody. That's not realistic. So when you look to work together as, as public and private entities, I think one of the key aspects of that that we've chased uh, is to spread that cost out in the most efficient way uh, and have that, that cost be borne uh, as much, if not more, or entirely uh, by industry um, versus government trying to be the, the savior of, 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 of all problems at unlimited expense, which is not practical. I think that's a core aspect of public private partnerships is spreading the cost of of these mitigation efforts uh, across all stakeholders involved and not just making it a burden of government. I think you could, you know, I think you could really look at this uh, either on the front side or the back side. And I think the group here would agree an investment on the front side is going to be way less than what we would see on the back side. When we look at the amount of money paid out for ransomware from a, uh, you know, just to get them their data, their own data back uh, versus what it would have cost on the front side to protect it, uh, it's incredible the, the difference in that. And so uh, we do need to um, do mitigation work. We need to, to do preventive work on the front side for, for cyber. Uh, on the funding dollars that we use for the state, um, that are eligible for uh, for folks to work with. Uh, we've increased, we've actually set a percentage now that uh, we put against uh, cyber and, uh, and cyber threats, cyber education, uh, infrastructure to protect our systems. Uh, and so there is a recognition and some funding now being put at that. And at the national level, there's a, uh, we have a requirement uh, when we're using federal dollars to put that towards uh, that as well. And so, uh, Annie, I think uh, um, the more we can do on, on education and prevention on the front side, uh, will pay big dividends to us uh, as we go forward. Got it, thank you. Um, I see my colleague Zach Williams popping in here, which means it's time to wrap up. Um, I wanna thank all of our panelists here uh, for really covering a large amount of ground in a very short time. There's always more to talk about here. I like to stay on longer. Um, but I think we've given a good uh, kickoff conversation here for the day. Um, thank you all for participating again, and I will hand it back over to Zach Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. They certainly delivered, did they not? Uh, great discussion covering a lot, a lot of issues affecting public safety and infrastructure, but we're going to keep the conversation going from here. We got another great lineup of big thinkers this time on public safety re-examined. And this discussion will be moderated by Summer Kershid, senior reporter at Gotham Gazette. Hi everyone. Um, do we have everyone here? Uh, I think we're just waiting for people to join. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, kick off sort of this um, this panel. Welcome everyone. I'm glad to have glad to be 
moderating this uh, conversation today, and I'm so happy you guys could all join us. Um, we have today um, public advocate Jamani Williams. Um, we're going to be expecting City Council Member Adrian Adams. Um, we have First Deputy Commissioner Laura Kavanaugh from the FDNY. Um, Edward Michael, who is an instructor and developer for Celebrite, a digital intelligence company, and Anne Mara, who's a healthcare innovation leader for Splunk, um, a data to everything platform that uses data for organizational efficiency. Uh, so I'm going to kick off um, this conversation uh, with you, Mr. Williams. Um, in the last year, when we last had this conversation, we were talking about public safety in the wake of the defund movement, when conversation was shifting from um, diverting resources from the NYPD towards communities. Um, in the last year, we've seen uh, a concerning rise in um, certain violent crimes, shootings, and homicides, which has led to a sort of a backlash against the defund movement. Um, it's a much more nuanced, of course, but we've seen the police budget increase this year. Um, how do you think the perception of public safety, especially in the wake of the pandemic, um, has changed and do you think the focus is too much on crime as as a, as a measure of public safety and policing as a solution to it well what i always want to say i think the people who fed the, the quote-unquote backlash like really fed into it uh were never really trying to get to the solutions that we wanted to get to in the first place so that was just an a kind of easy out and i've always said uh my job and, and i think most particularly the elected officials who are on here, our job is not to tell uh, people on the street how to express their trauma. Our job is to take that trauma, what they bring to us, and turn it into real policies. And that's what we have to do. And so I don't sit there arguing over how people express their trauma. It's my job to kind of reflect it and, and, and turn it into real policy. What I did, never heard was anyone say, let's defund public safety. And I think that's an important key because what we've done far too often is equate public safety with policing. Um, that's the damage and the, and the danger that we always fall into and that's the trap. And so we have to understand that uh, policing and law enforcement, I should say, is a part of what we we have to do in terms of public safety. It always, will, probably always will be. The problem is we've never fully funded or embraced the other parts of things that lead to public safety, never properly funded those things, never really changed uh, the structure and the infrastructure of how we get to public safety. You look at something that we've been pushing for such a long time, which is uh, who looks at Comstat and who doesn't. Uh, and the police right now, the only one to look at that data. Uh, something as simple as opening up to other agencies and community groups can just change the way of who we allow to be in the public safety space in a very real way at, at the adults table uh, and who we don't. And I think that's important. And, and I was proud to be uh, the chair of the task force to combat gun violence over a decade ago. And the things that, uh, about a decade, the things that we put in place, the policies, the solutions that were funded, we actually helped become the safest city we've ever been in history up until the pandemic. Now, if you're a victim of violence, that data means nothing. Uh, so we have to be aware of that data but we're moving in the right direction. What we never had, and one of the saddest parts I've seen even in this whole debate around defund or a billion dollars last year, was we lost the opportunity to make the structural change that was needed. And I don't think this administration ever really bought into really changing that structure in a real way. And my hope is uh, seeing now city, state, and federal really focusing on gun violence in a way that I haven't seen uh, in, in such a long time if ever, and I'm really hoping that we don't lose this opportunity and fall victim to the same old tropes that we see people apologizing for 30 years ago and make that mistake that we have to apologize 30 years from now. So that raises the question of, um, and Council Member Adams, I'll turn to you here. Um, last year, you were one of the members uh, uh, during when the budget was being passed with a very controversial, um, contentious budget, um, which revolved around the 1 billion, uh, you know, what was supposed to be a 1 billion cut to the NYPD, but ended up being closer to 300 million in the end. Um, you uh, defended, um, you know, you defended voting for the budget saying that you did not want those um, cuts to the um, NYPD because most of they would have affected the school safety budget and, you know, the, the largest staff of black and brown people. Um, 
do you think that at the time you talked about there needed to be a more nuanced conversation about creating public safety that didn't sacrifice safety in communities of color? Do you think that conversation has happened in the last year? And do you think it's happened in this year's budget at all? Have, have any of the things that you wanted to see passed have happened? Thank, thank you for the question. Um, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you for having this panel today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on, uh, of course, with my colleagues, in particular, the uh, public advocate. And I agree with everything that Jamani just said, by the way. Um, I, as far as the budget last year is concerned, uh, the budget was tragic. Um, in no uncertain terms, that budget was a tragedy. It was a tragedy for those of us that sat on the budget negotiating team. And it was a tragedy for the public that had to deal with it, had to deal with the city council starting out with zero, with a blank slate, and having to create those things that had never been created before. We were in the midst, and still are, by the way, of a global pandemic, even though we're trying to act like we're not. We still are in the midst of a very significant pandemic uh, that we are seeing continue to strike our communities, in particular communities of color, still to this day. So when it comes to actually uh, the budget, what it did and didn't do, um, the conversations are still absolutely happening. As a part of the team still, we're still having those conversations at the table, the budget that we just passed a few weeks ago. Some of the situations, too many of them, I should say, that we uh, faced last year, we are still facing to this day. Again, I agree with the public advocate. Some conversations have yet to be had. We have got to have them. We've got to be serious. Public safety is not just about policing, and we've got to stop bottling public safety up with just meaning the NYPD when it means so much more than the NYPD. The, the, and, and just to go back to the, the original part of your question, which was a very good one, what my feelings were about uh, passing the budget that we passed last year and the funds that, quote unquote, were taken away from the police or were not taken away from the police. I voted the conscience of my community. I voted the conscience of my constituents who want no part of hashtag defund, by the way, um, for, for a very good reason. Um, I voted what I was hearing from them, and that is that all they want is to live together with the NYPD, not without the NYPD. What they want are, is to make sure that their civil rights are protected, that they are protected, and that they are treated humanely. So around this conversation of public safety has to come the conversation of humanity, and equity. Equity is the hashtag these days for good reason as well. So I think that we've got to incorporate those words into all of the conversations that we have around public safety. That raises the question of, you know, without relating the past too much, um, what what is structural change in public safety look like to you? Um, and I want to throw this question to you, Councilmember Adams, first, and then the public advocate before um, I want I, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Cavanaugh to weigh in because um, you know the EMS uh, teams with the FNY are one of the things that the mayor announced last in the last year, um, and that's one of the sort of structural changes of public safety. I'd say sending out mental health response teams instead of the police to respond to people in um, uh, experiencing emotional crises. Uh, so, uh, what does structural change look like, Council Member? Structural change is going to take a lot of work. Uh, for me, structural change has everything to do with systemic racism across the board. And it's not just, again, with public safety. It's with every entity, every agency that we deal with in the city of New York. Um, it, it, is, it is inherent in the DNA um, of the United States. And of course, it is inherent in the DNA across the city of New York. So before we talk about any kind of structural changes, we've got to face facts. Um, and we've got to face the fact that there is systemic racism everywhere on every corner that we work and that we live on, that we breathe in, in New York City. So that said, once we take a look at that and face those facts, we've got to take a look at the resources that never were, as the public advocate said. The places that we start out with are going to have to be realizing the equity and making that happen in communities of color and places that have never seen it before. There is a reason that we have violence. There is a reason that we have unsanitary conditions. There is a reason that we have consistent mental health issues in certain communities as opposed to other communities. So before we can take a look at anything else, we've got to take a look at and admit the, the inherent racism that we're facing. We've got to deal with it in education. We've got to deal with it in health. We've got to deal with it in public safety. So again, before we can 
come up with anything else. I think that is the foundation and the bedrock that we have to deal with because that is the foundation and the bedrock that we are built on. Um, Mr. Public, very briefly. Yeah. Thank you. Your first, uh, I want to say that the first thing is to, is to recognize um, that public safety is not equated with uh, with policing. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of folks got to know the work I did around policing issues. I'm most proud of the work I did around gun violence. And I understand now that there's no amount of reforms to the police department that are going to get to where we need to go. Uh, we need more accountability. We need, need more transparency. But what the problem has been is while we're trying to reform a department, we're not changing what public safety is. And so we keep getting the department to solve all the problems that many agencies uh, need to be involved with, in community, including community groups. And I, I want to say this to answer your question, because I went to Newark, New Jersey. And last year, New York, during the pandemic, they had no increase in gun violence. They had no police shootings. I think they've had uh, one since. Their, their Floyd protests uh, didn't have the same results that we see in other cities including ours, they were the one, one of maybe two or three cities where that happened. If you knew Newark way back when, you'd be shocked. And I called Mayor Ross Baraka and I said, what is happening there? He actually said, well, we're doing some of the, many of the things that you're doing over here, things that I've championed, things that we funded. And I went over to figure out what is the difference. And the difference was we had a mayor that was bought in. We had a police commissioner that was bought in. We had a public safety director, which the police commissioner actually reported to, that were all bought in. And so these weren't one-off programs that were funded. These were everybody sitting at the table, the same table, the adults table. We have an awesome mayor's office of gun violence prevention, but where do they sit in terms of who's making decisions, uh, what's what, uh, and where, what's going? They said every time they hire, they hire 10 or so police officers, they hire a social worker. Those persons graduate in the same stage as the police officers. They've made structural changes every step of the way so that the police are not the ones reliant uh, that people are reliant on to solve all problems. That's something that we haven't done here. You look at the mental health and the biggest fight I've had with the administration is they refuse to accept that we can have a situation where police are not the only ones, uh, are not the first ones responding. We're doing some things, but we're definitely not where we should be. And it seems that there's a grip on us uh, in terms of releasing that grip, uh, understanding that police are not the only ones uh, to deal with this. And lastly, I'll say, when it comes to funding, if we have a, if you ask people the questions about where things should be funded and if they should be funded, they would say yes. And when we start to explain how much money is actually in the police department and where that money is spent, should we reallocate? Those same communities would also say yes. And so whether you call it defund, refund, whatever it is, we have to stop asking the wrong questions because we'll get the wrong answers. So we ask people, uh, they say, oh, these communities, they still want police. And what I often say is, yes, they've also asked for better housing conditions. They've also asked for uh, more mental health programs. They also asked for better schools, but we've never answered those questions. NYCHA asked for more uh, cameras before some seniors were murdered by a mass murder who would have gotten caught. Why don't we answer those questions? And so I want to make sure we want to ask the right questions so we can get the right answers. Uh, I want to turn to you, Ms. Kavanaugh. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about here is um, new solutions to uh, public safety. Uh, the mayor's been very, uh, you know, the mayor's started the new program with EMS workers working with FDNY, um, working with health and hospitals um, to uh, treat people, to respond to people in mental um, health distress. Um, is that just a, is that a, a, a good enough solution? Is there more on the horizon? What can we expect? Um, and what do you think it, the city needs to do right now to both um, build, uh, you know, provide public safety, let's build trust in the city's response um, to those situations. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. And I think I would springboard um, off of what the public advocate and the council member have said, who have both been very supportive on this issue. Um, you know, I think it's all about infrastructure and it's all about 360 degree solutions. So, you know, we are very proud of this program. I am very proud of this program. Um, you know, it stems from personal experience. You know, we definitely want people to have other options when they have a, a mentally ill family member that um, not only is it not necessarily the police that are arriving, but it's people with additional skill sets. Our EMTs and paramedics are fantastic uh, and social workers who can really set up 
um, long-term solutions. And, you know, I think that's what's required. I think you'll see expansion of this program. Um, and that's, you know, something I think the public is really looking for. Um, but I would say that, you know, no matter how fantastic our response is, no how, matter how fantastic our care is on scene, um, if we bring someone to an emergency room and they're in and out of that emergency room and there's no infrastructure for health insurance for them, there's no infrastructure for long-term mental health care, we will be back at their home again in a week or a month or, you know, sometimes even in the same day. And so I think, you know, when it comes to both this program, but also the larger issue of healthcare inequity, you know, that's really where you have to go to solve those inequities. Um, we can have a great response. And I think this program, you know, is something that is going to be great for the city and will expand, but you really need to make sure that the infrastructure is in place for care for the most vulnerable members, you know, after we respond uh, and, and, and ongoing from there and in the neighborhoods who need it most and who call 911 most often. Um, I, I kind of want to move on to our other panelists. I want to give you guys the opportunity to talk here. Um, both uh, Ms. Mara and Mr. Michael work in data and digital tools, um, you know, about how to improve, uh, in Ms. Mara's case, like operational efficiency, in Mr. Michael's case, like digital intelligence tools. Uh, you know, we've got, Eric Adams is uh, likely to be the next mayor of New York City. He is a data-driven guy. He wants to bring a sort of comp stat approach to uh, city government and improve, uh, cut wasteful spending and uh, Im uh, improve how government delivers services. So um, I'll start with you, uh, Ms. Mera. Um, how do you think using data, how do you improve on public safety and, and which aspects of city government do you think can be improved that make it a safer city? And this is of course not just limited to police, but I know your healthcare is your specialty. Um, in the wake of a pandemic, access to healthcare. If people have more access to healthcare, does that make it a safer city? Please. Thank you, Samar. Uh, first of all, it's truly a privilege and an honor uh, to have the opportunity to return as a New Yorker today, uh, albeit virtually, uh, to speak alongside uh, colleagues who are doing God's work, uh, helping save lives each and every day. And for your service and dedication, I thank and applaud you. Um, if you Google Splunk, you will come to think or may even know Splunk as a cybersecurity observability and IT company. And no doubt, uh, we are definitely that. Um, but as we learned earlier in the summit today uh, from our first uh, Deputy Commissioner Tucker, who uh, kicked off the summit and described our challenges as a triple threat, one, the ravages of COVID that include the uniform sick rate, two, the protests, and three, the steep increases in shootings and violent crimes and gun violence that my colleagues here have talked about. Our world today lies at the intersection of public safety and public health. And thus a coordination across a multi-stakeholder community of police, citizens, policymakers, state and local uh, agency staff, and healthcare providers to help suppress crime and violence and ensure healthy living for all New Yorkers is not a nice to have, but a must have. And so if you would allow me to be bold and say, what we need in a post pandemic world is an equitable, immortal platform an N of N of N platform that yields not only a return on investment and ROI, uh, but more importantly, an ROL, a return on life. And why do we need this equitable immortal platform? Because as my colleagues have said, we do not know where when, how, and why the next unfortunate New York event or events emerge. And so within this immortal platform, we need the ability to ingest an N number of data types, both structured and unstructured, found in N number of data sources, both machine and non-machine, and query n amounts of data. 
Namely, we require schema on the fly. We leave the data where it is and how it is to protect the privacy of all. And we couple this N of N platform with hands-on knowledge and experience that's captured from the field, from the streets of New York City and New York State, and those situational rooms in which we find resources coming together from all departments, safety, to health, to housing. And we need to apply more machine learning and artificial intelligence equitable capabilities that are available to us today, whether it's in the form of virtual reality, augmented reality, quantum computing, edge computing technologies, you know, just to name a few. And we convert this knowledge into algorithms, equitable algorithms, to not only prevent these unfortunate circumstances from occurring, be they cloaked in the form of a terrorist or a spike protein or a natural disaster, but help predict these events before they occur. So together in these public-private partnerships with stakeholders like we have as speakers today and technologies like Splunk, we will continue to work to ensure the safety and well being of all New Yorkers. And most importantly, Summer, we need this immortal platform to predict calamities and unfortunate occurrences in near and real time, 24 7, just like the city that never sleeps. There is no room for error when we calculate a return on life. I'm, uh, I'm gonna to turn to you, Mr. Michael. Um, you know, uh, how, can we, how can the city use digital tools to improve on public safety? Um, are there any risks and concerns involved? Um, what do you think? Uh, first of all, thank you, Samara. Thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's definitely uh, a privilege to be part of, uh, of the panel here with the, with the, the other respected panelists. Um, and to the guests that have attended. Um, I'm also, like uh, Ms. Mara, a, a returning New Yorker. Um, I moved away many, many years ago and never had a chance to move back, but um, I, I still have uh, a lot of family there and still go to a, a visit. It's where I kind of draw my roots from. Um, my background is in uh, a little over 20 years in uh, law enforcement, um, uh, specifically pertaining to, uh, uh, I spent the first 10 years um, in patrol, and then after that, I spent time in in digital forensics and collecting information um, uh, from digital devices, and uh, as it applies to to crime. Um, and speaking from from that vantage point, I definitely can appreciate the message of public safety. And um, I def I definitely, obviously, because my background as far as the defund the police movement, I mean, I have my own opinions on that, but there definitely needs to be more value placed on public safety and the public sector as a whole. There was times that I, I agree with what Mr. Williams said, 100, 110%, not everything requires a police officer's response. And there were times that there were uh, situations that we handled that, that weren't really reflective of what we were best trained to do. Um, and, and it was hard. We didn't really have any resources to turn to, um, you know, fast forwarding to, you know, 2010, 2015, 2020, um, almost everybody has, uh, almost all crime now has some type of uh, electronic uh, uh, buy-in, whether it be phone data or computer data or, 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 or video. Um, what, one of the things Celebrite does and one of the things I'm a big believer in is taking this all this data and providing it, putting it into a digital intelligence solution. Um, so as a whole, does this benefit law enforcement? 100%. It benefits law enforcement and the communities they serve. Um, it can act for um, quicker closure of crime for the communities they serve, better protection for the victims. One of the biggest reasons as far as digital intelligence as a, as a, as a whole, I believe in, is because it frees up, uh, one, it frees up dollars and it frees up value, value in people to go do other things, whether it be training, whether it be community outreach programs, whether it be uh, other other type of enforcement activities. Um, for this, you know, in this particular case, we're talking about NYPD. Um, 
by having a, a method to look at and analyze this digital data, um, it, it definitely allows us an overview from all in one place uh, for prosecution, for protection of the victims, um, for making sure innocent people um, are, 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 are innocent. Um, and um, probably the second half of that, a big, uh, kind of a big point I had right before I retired with my own uh, uh, agency um, is accountability. Um, and this is huge, you know, as people move forward and the police have gotten law enforcement as a whole across the country have gotten to the state that they are, I don't want to be the one sitting up in the stand where I'm not believed. It's my word against somebody else's. And I will tell you as far as five years ago, I could say, obviously not whatever I wanted to, but I could say my factual recollection of the events, the way I recalled it, and it very well may differ from what something showed on video or what somebody else saw. And what digital intelligence allows you to do is you still have the human factor, but I want to be able to show to juries. I want the jury to see the video. I want the jury to see the text messages. I want the jury to see the data and form their own conclusions. And as you know, in case there may be any doubt, uh, a reflection on law enforcement and a whole, we're still moving forward with successful prosecutions for, for violent offenders. Um, and we're still capable of, of making sure that, you know, definitely holding, uh, both, both citizens and law enforcement accountable for their actions in case there is something in that digital uh, intelligence model that, that shows anything different. Uh, so, you know, while we're talking about data and this sort of brings you to the question of how do you measure public safety? Um, and I wanna ask uh, um, Public Advocate Williams, um, do, does the city need a more holistic measure of public safety? Say for instance, if a year from now, the murder rate's down, the shooting rate is down, but we have more homeless people uh, on the street. I mean, more people are experiencing homelessness, pardon me, uh, and fewer people have access to mental health care. Does that, make this, does that mean the city's safer? And conversely, if the crime rate goes up, but more people are housed and um, more people are receiving mental health services, is that also a measure of public safety? Do we need a more holistic measure by which to judge public safety and what's an appropriate way to create that measure? You know, what, what I would say is one, we, we all have to agree and it seems like slowly the city state and federally we're starting to really, that's probably one plus from the summer protests we had, people are starting to really think about this in a more holistic way. Uh, hopefully that trend continues. I'm probably gonna, very much steal Miss Mira's return on life reference. I love that uh, ROL. Um, I think that's really what the focus has to be. Uh, what is bringing us a, a real return on life and, and a real return on a good quality life? Because most of these communities, they get stuck between uh, very real street violence and very real over-policing that's supposed to help the street violence. It was, although it usually doesn't happen one for one. And what often happens is if these communities dare to even ask for to not be over policed, they'll get under policing and they won't get any of the services that, that they are, are supposed to get. And that's not the reality that people want either. And we have to be honest about what happens and why it happens. And so when we talk about a holistic approach to things, one, I just always want to make sure we're, we're clear. We have to talk about the safety and in the perception, because those are sometimes two different things. Sometimes people are safe, but don't perceive themselves to be safe. And even worse things can happen at that moment in time. But I think, you know, I come from the uh, the crazy left wing of the, of, of the party, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, used to be uh, not a lot of voices like mine, but now there's a ton of them. Uh, and I, um, I'm i happy to, to be here. Actually, and I know uh, uh, sometimes a, uh, my, my colleague Adam is not as left of me, but she is uh, definitely uh, echoing uh, many of the causes that we lift up. And I appreciate the work that, that she's always doing there. Uh, and we have a great uh, panel here. But what I want to say is, we have, to, I, I am also data driven. So I think one of the things we have to do better on the left is looking at this data and lifting up what's actually happening. So we, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen very well. My hope is that that begins to happen. We can't ignore the spikes in, in, in gun violence and the spikes in violent crime, which is by the way, occurring across the nation. So we have to stop blaming things like New York State's bail reform for the rise in crime all over the nation. We have to look at this thing. But what I have put forth and everybody most likely agrees 
is this data sets travel the same. So the communities that have the high rates of homelessness have the high rates uh, of um, uh, unemployment, have high rates of not being able to access quality health care, have high rates of uh, maternal, um, uh, maternal health issues. They are all the same places that you see these rises in crime and certain violent crimes. And so what I submit and continue to submit is if we address those issues, the data will actually go the same way. And so it's clear when you vision and envision, what does a community that you think of as safe, what does that look like if you close your eyes? And I will say to you, most of the places you would think of do not have police on every corner. In fact, the ones that do, you probably don't deem them safe, even if they do have a police officer on every corner. And so that doesn't mean that that officer doesn't have a job to do, but the safety looks like the communities that have all of the things and access to all of the things that we just described. And they do that without having a police officer on every corner. So yes, we have to look at this holistically. And yes, we do have to look at data because we want the data to go in the right direction. But we have to be clear about what it is that we're looking at and how we're gonna get that return on life. Because when we throw police at these communities, the return on life is not very good. Um, and we have to be clear about that. And the quality of life is not very good. And I, I'm interested to hear, we probably won't hear it here, but I'm interested to hear more about what Mr. Michael's um, data usage is. We have some concern. I think that, uh, data and, 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 and digital and technology is important, uh, but we have, to, uh, we have to be careful sometimes about what we do, things like facial recognition. We've seen it um, a trend the same bias ways uh, that uh, policing, not just policing, by the way, policing, education, health, all of those things, the, the unconscious bias that stays there, uh, we've seen some of the digital ramps. So I just wanna make sure uh, that that doesn't happen in some of the things that we're trying, uh, trying to push as well. Uh, uh, Ms. Adams? What's, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm writing and Jamani just, you know, stole my thunder because, you know, as Mr. Michael was speaking, the, the words that I wrote down, we've got the technology, now what do we do with it? Do we continue to see the data through the same lens that we've always seen it through? Do we continue to just bear through this information that we have and use it, you know, in, in the skewed fashion that we've always had it used? And it is very skewed. Uh, you know, I, I come from a technology background. I love data. I love, you know, I, I love all of this. But the, my problem is, again, the way that it's been used, um, the way that it's been used against certain communities. Um, we could cite a very specific case here in New York, but I won't do that, um, you know, where information was used and it was used in communities of color only for quote unquote DNA purposes. And it had, it ended up rounding up, you know, a number of black men that I, I I'm told is still uh, who are traumatized this day to having their doors knocked on, you know, by, by, you know, by police you know, in order to get their DNA, you know, whatever. So, so my whole thing again is, yes, we have the technology. It's amazing. It's remarkable. I don't think that, that it's uh, transparent though. I do think that people's privacy is invaded. I do believe that people's civil rights are trounced upon in some cases as well. So uh, this information is fantastic. But the perspective of mine is now we've got this, we've got this amazing technology. Um, you know, the world over, but what are we doing with it? How are we using it to the best of our advantage to right the wrongs that have been done in our society? So, you know, instead of a statement, um, Summer, I've got, you know, more of a question. We've got it. What are we going to do with it? We've got to do better. Uh, I'm going to, before I throw it to Mr. Michael for a response, I'm, I just want to ask uh, Ms. Kavanaugh. Um, what do you see as a more holistic measure of uh, public safety in this city? And what do you think the city can do to achieve that more holistic metric? So I think it is those um, community outcomes. You know, the FENY EMS is the front line of healthcare, but it's not just about what happens when we respond. It's, you know, what are the rates of heart disease in that community? What are the rates of obesity in that community? And how do we connect what we do to those long-term outcomes, right? Because that's really, we wanna be part of the healthcare system that lifts people up, not just be part of the response. You know, that's our first job, but we also wanna be there um, to actually make sure our community is, is healthier. And I think sort of bringing it back to the data, cause I'm assuming uh, Mr. Michael is going next is I think, you know, my, part of my question would be for him as well. You know, how does an agency like the fire department connect with those other data sources so that we can, you know, 
put our, our outcomes and our operations in line um, with the larger healthcare system, the larger health of a community to know that you know we're playing uh, an important role and we're playing a proactive role in that. Uh, Ms. Michael, I'll turn to you. And then Ms. Mayer, I'm sure you have something that you want to weigh in as well. Uh, Ms. Michael. Great. Uh, thank you. First, I, I just want to put um, um, actually uh, Ms. Adams and Mr. Williams and, and Ms. Well, and, and Ms. Cavanaugh didn't bring it up, but, uh, but for uh, Ms. Adams and Mr. Williams, um, Cellarite's technology isn't, and, and, and I, I, it's hard using the term digital intelligence because everybody automatically thinks of terms like surveillance and facial, facial recognition, things like that. That's not what our, our technology is about at all. Um, we're taking, and I've seen, I've been involved uh, in law enforcement outside of Cellarite in some uh, probably controversial facial recognition projects, not me directly, but as a result of, of them being used. Um, and there's, there's none of that at use. What, when we talk about the digital intelligence uh, solutions specifically for law enforcement, specifically for Celebrite, it's taking data that's already available and combining it, it's still reviewed by a, a person. Um, there is no automated process. Um, and I think from my standpoint, from doing 12 years of these investigations, everything from, I've been involved in everything from uh, overseas terrorism investigations, the Boston bombing investigations to local you know, local stolen car investigations, um, it is important to keep the human in that. It's taking those data sources and it's not giving me the answer. I still have to find the answer. It's just giving me an easier way to find it. Um, I definitely wouldn't trust. Um, I, I don't want to say, let me rephrase that. I, I don't want to say not trust, but, you know, I wouldn't take an automated response that the computer gave me uh, without review, especially we're talking about somebody's uh, potential freedom. The last thing we ever want to do, um, or the last thing we, or especially me, ever want to do is have somebody, uh, you know, that's a person of interest or a su suspect that that didn't didn't deserve to be, um, or wasn't, you know, I say deserve, but, you know, wasn't, um, uh, there wasn't a re reason to suspect them. Um, so for the facial recognition part and uh, the whole surveillance part, none of that's part of the solutions. Um, this is taking data that's already already available and cutting down on the review time for it. Um, Celebrite's big goal and mission when it comes to digital intelligence is to make it easier for the analyst, the investigator to locate the relevant data and definitely not, you know, we definitely don't want to cut that, that, that process out. Um, as for, for Ms. Kavanaugh specifically, as far as getting that data, you know, how does it apply to public safety as a whole? Um, currently, probably not a lot, but I know one of the big goals in the future um, is to get that data combined with other statistical sources, just uh, not just within the criminal justice community and law enforcement community, um, but looking at areas, you know, where we see, um, you know, not even the most crime, but we see the most resources are needed. Again, it's still reviewed by a human, but this way you can plan your, uh, your response times, where to put you, your resources, where there are people in need, where there are where we have the most mental health uh, uh, crises. I can tell you still from 10 years ago, I remember probably the same five houses I used to go to, you know, at least multiple times a year where, you know, there was somebody there in distress. Those, you know, they don't, you know, they don't have an opportunity because there's nowhere for them to go to move on. Um, so they're at home and this, you know, the digital intelligence solutions help you identify those. So you can have those resources available to respond. And Ms. Adams and Ms. Uh, Mr. Williams, I hope I put your mind at ease, at least at least for 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 some of it. Uh, so I guess basically the question becomes, what's how does how does the city responsibly use uh, these giant data sources to um, pursue sort of human-based solutions, like human? centric solutions. And Ms. Mara, if you want to quickly take that, we have about 10 minutes left in this panel. So have, I have one last question I'd like to ask everyone um, after, after we hear from Ms. Mara. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, while the conversation is about data and data as an asset, um, I think uh, what everyone has shared really sums up to education. We need to be educating every New Yorker and every stakeholder to ensure that the data assets and technologies that are available today and that are gonna be developed for tomorrow are being used fairly and equitably. Um, so, you know, uh, I think re I'm reminded of the time when the internet was born. Uh, it was viewed both as a, as a blessing and a curse. I think the same is true for the data assets and the technologies we have today. Uh, it's really upon us to educate 
everyone to uh, have a better understanding and appreciation for how, when, why, and where uh, we use the data that's available to us. So um, I'm going to bring this down to my final question. Um, you know, we, we began this conversation starting to talk about public safety uh, in the context of equity and, and um, you know, uh, racial, racially sort of equal outcome because the, you know, it's, it's, I think we can all agree that black and brown people just have disproportionately have had worse health outcomes, have had, you know, worse um, interactions with the police. There's no debating that. Um, the mayor has created a racial justice commission that will propose uh, solutions in December that will be on the November 2022 ballot. So that's going to be looking at structural changes in the city charter. And that's, that's something that's going to be the city charter of the city's constitution. So from each of you, any of you, I'd like to hear what, what structural solutions, what changes would you like to see to the city charter that could make the city uh, safer in perpetuity, arguably? Mr. Williams, I'll let you go first. Um, that's a great question. Shout out, you know, there's a few commissioners there that I think uh, 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 about it. So I want to, you know, shout out Kay Bain, uh, Mr. Louis Favors, uh, Joanne Yu. They, I know they're going to do awesome work and make sure that uh, we're in the right direction. I did want to say uh, to Mr. Michael, I don't know if uh, all the concerns are assuaged, but I appreciate you uh, starting to talk about what it is. I definitely would like to, you know, hear, hear some more information. Um, I would say I'm looking forward to what they come up with. Um, I don't, in terms of the charter of powers, one, I, I'd love to see more balance just in general between the powers of the council and, and the mayor, just generally speaking. I think no matter who the mayor is, there's too much of a, this is the strongest mayoralty in the entire country. And so uh, that makes it difficult. A lot of times folks are looking at the council to do things that they actually can't do. One of the things that I would love to see is that uh, the, the, uh, there are certain commissioners and chancellors that I believe the, the city council should have advice and consent on. Uh, one of them is the commissioner at least and the other is the, the chancellor of education. So I'd love to, sorry? You, say, you mean the police commissioner, right? Yeah, commissioner, uh, sorry, commissioner of NYPD and the chancellor of uh, Department of Education. Uh, there's a bunch of other charter things I think could change uh, that I'd love to see happen. But um, I think it's important that we uh, look at all of the institutions. And one of the things that I've always had an issue with is when we talk about public safety, we talk about the abuses, it's the hyper focus on the police. And I understand why, because when it happens, it happens quickly. But some of these institutions are killing the same people. They're just doing it a lot slower. And I would like to see the same kind of vigilance in the education department, in the health department, so that we can uh, see and, 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 and uplift the same kind of tragedies that are happening there time and time again. As a matter of fact, those are the tragedies uh, that we're often sending the police department in to solve that they don't have the ability to solve. And as Mr. Michaels has put out, if you ask, talk, if you talk to some of these police officers, there are many of these calls that they don't want to be going on because they don't have the tools to actually solve it. So in a lot of these things, we're actually on the same page. Uh, and uh, I also want to say, we, we talk about, uh, you know, police again, and I've often said, we're not even looking at the, the um, tools that we have. And, what, and so we have a, a department as 34, 35, 5,000 police officers, people are saying um, we need more. They're not even discussed about where those officers are being deployed. Are they in the subways looking to see who hopped the fare? Or are they walking around uh, in the trains to see what's happening? And so these are the type of discussions that I'm hoping um, the next administration will help lead. It's, it's harder to have this discussion. So, because most folks who think they disagree with me, when we actually sit down and have discussion, we're much more aligned. But it is easier to feed the fears of public safety because the rewards are usually quicker and faster. But what we need is leadership that will help parse through what people are feeling. People want to feel safe and they want to be safe. And we need to walk them through what does that actually mean and what does all of the knowledge that we have lead us to say actually works. And it's easy to say, I'm going to send more police to your community um, because we're trained to do that and we're trained to believe that that is what causes the relief but when we look at it, it's actually by itself not. And we know that. Uh, we know that for certain communities, but for others, we really don't take the time uh, to really explain why this can't be the sole solution that we push forward. And that takes leadership. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, that's the leadership we see 
in the coming administrations. And uh, finally, the city, the state, and the federal government may be aligned, particularly on gun violence. And uh, I'm looking forward to be a part of that discussion. People on this panel, especially uh, the public safety chair, Ms. Adams. Uh, Ms. Adams, um, what charter changes do you think could make New York City safer in the long run? You know, I, I love it when we speak about this particular um, commission. I actually eavesdropped on um, their last meeting, which happened to have, have uh, they had uh, yesterday evening. So um, I, I, I'm really, um, uh, <sighs> I'm in awe of the talent that all of them bring to the commission, um, but they definitely have their work cut out for them. You know, when it comes to this particular issue and, and yet another, you know, ch charter mandate, so, uh, you know, Jamani said everything perfectly, you know, eloquent. I'll just take this discussion just a certain way that uh, we don't necessarily look at public safety. Um, for me, in, in looking at particularly my district, language access is a public safety issue for us here. Um, when we take a look at the fact that uh, in 2021, New York City does not honor the languages that are spoken here, we are a city of immigrants. Um, and New York City does not honor the number of languages that are spoken in this city down to the city council level where we cannot even have interpretation in our hearings to accommodate the witnesses that are there in oversight with us. That's a problem for me as public safety chair. So I've seen, you know, over the past six months that I've, you know, had oversight over public safety, you know, for me, um, being the committee chair and having to hear testimony uh, for different areas of this city, and there is a distinct language barrier. We have no interpretation services on the council level to handle that. I asked about it once, and I was told that when we had it last in budget hearing for last year, um, it cost a lot of money for the city council to do, do this, and I'm going to cost a lot of money. Would it, this should be automatic here. You know, and I, I sound like, you know, like, a, 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 I don't even know, but I'm going, this is New York. You know, what are we talking about? We don't do this. So for me, in, in looking at this particular um, commission right now, they need to have serious discussions around the issue of language access as it pertains to public safety. So that would be my throw into that. Uh, we have just about three minutes left. Uh, Ms. Kavanaugh, do you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, I think I, I will just echo... Um, you know, what the public advocate and the council member said. And, and to keep it short, I think I would also just ask the, the commission look at pay and equity within the agencies as well. I think when you're talking about pay and equity in the community, you know, how can you have that if you don't have that in the agencies? And I think they both probably know what I'm referring to. So I, I would definitely ask that, uh, you know, when you're talking about structural change, that structural change has to be economic. Um, and so I hope that they look at that as an issue. I think we should just say EMS. I'll say if you, if you can't say it. Uh, thank you, sir. Say it out loud. Uh, Ms. Michael, uh, Ms. Mara, if anything, anything you want to add here? And what's a good structural change you could see uh, in the city charter that would improve public safety? Uh, yeah, thanks, Summer, and thank you, everyone. Um, if I may, uh, you know, this, this pandemic and what this pandemic has taught us, I'm reminded of the uh, line from To a Mouse uh, by Robert Burns. The uh, best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Uh, thus, resiliency and equitable access to information and insights on any device uh, speaking to us in any language becomes valuable and allows us to remain focused on ROL. All right. Thank you. Ms. Michael? It was so not on as far as the changes to the city charter, you know, I would love to see New York um, thrive again back. I mean, even even two and a half, three years ago, the last time I was there, even even uh, uh, where we were then, um, I, you know, I, I believe it's it's always hard. I don't want to say hard, but it can sometimes be a challenging coming from a law enforcement background. Um, but, I, you know, I agree with uh, with uh, Ms. Adams and Mr. Williams and Ms. Ms., Ms., Ms. Uh, Kavanaugh as well. Everything, you know, we need to focus on the resources available for public safety as a whole. I really think when it comes to city charter, um, you know, the reallocation of resources and getting people into their specific job roles uh, is really what what needs to be done. Let the police, based upon, uh, you know, 
fighting crime, deal with violent crime, and and definitely have resources out there for uh, uh, mental health, both on scene and then even the next steps. Because even, and I, was, I know I said it once, but I'll repeat it again, especially when it comes to mental health and issues like homelessness, there's only so far we can go. Um, and then we run out of resources. I don't mean money resources, like physical resources of what to do next. I mean, I can hand it on to someone uh, who works for Ms. Kavanaugh, and then they take it and they hand it on as far as they go. And then what? There's a there's a definitive stopping line that really shouldn't be there. Uh, I guess uh, I believe that's the end of our time. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. I think it's been a pretty interesting conversation. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll hear more about uh, structural change to public safety in the next uh, coming year and then and then of course once this racial justice commission issues its proposals there will be a whole year of debate before these questions end up on the ballot so i'm sure we'll be debating this for the for the years to come thank you everyone thank Zach. you thank you well thank you so much summer for moderating such a great discussion and thank you to all of our panelists uh, and and as he said this conversation is not ending anytime soon it's going to be going forward. And luckily, we got Summer, who's one of the experts in the city on charter revisions. That's for sure. So before we get into our third and final discussion of the day, I do got to acknowledge once again our wonderful sponsors that helped put a, put put helped us put on this event uh, and all the great uh, speakers that you've heard thus far. They include CW, CDW, Berkeley College, Celebrite, Data Miner, Carter, Ledyard, and Milborne, Milborn, Corelight, Splunk, and SWAC. That's a Secure Worker Access Consortium. Couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much for helping us put on this event. Now, without further ado, it's our third and final discussion of the day and my opportunity to drop one of my favorite buzzwords of the 21st century, uh, digital hygiene. This panel will focus on keeping New York's information safe. Moderating this discussion is a real expert in this field, Christian Malik, Director of Business Diversity at CDW. Ready when you are, Kristen. For some reason, we can't hear you though. Are, are you on mute or something? Uh oh, it looks like we got a little bit of technical difficulties on her side. We'll just wait until she jumps in. Could be a microphone thing. Maybe she's got a uh, an AirPod handy, perhaps. Uh oh. <laughs> Well, I'll just filibuster a little bit here. Uh, you know, if, if you really want to keep up on issues like this, make sure to go to cityandstateny.com and subscribe to our first read newsletter, which will give you all the updates you need to keep up with everything going on with public safety in New York City, as well as just city politics in general. And of course, Albany Agenda is a newsletter that I, Zach Williams, senior state politics reporter at City and State, composes every week, comes out Monday afternoons, help you know everything that's going on in Albany, which of course has a huge influence on New York City policy. Oh, how are we doing? Up, oh, it looks like uh, Kristen is uh, has dropped out, and we'll be coming back in shortly. Maybe I will just uh, make an executive discussion, uh, executive decision here to maybe just have each of the panelists introduce themselves very briefly, just say a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how you fit into this discussion about keeping New York's information safe. Maybe we could start with uh, Wolf Moser. Sure, hi. Um, Wolf Moser, I, I'm one of the uh, a supervisor um, in the cyber branch of the New York office of the FBI. And um, I work one of the, um, one of the squads who's working in a, a task force environment to uh, investigate cybercrime. Excellent. And uh, how's the sound over on your side, uh, Christian? Oh, 
Can you hear me? Uh oh, we she dropped out. Maybe we could have uh, Ms. Baptiste uh, tell a little bit about herself. Sure. Good afternoon, and I apologize for the noise in the background. Someone who's decided to cut steel outside of my window. Uh, but there, there's New York City for you. Um, so my name is Yvonne Baptiste. I am an AVP at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, um, essentially the city's economic development arm. Um, we are focused at the moment on increasing the workforce participation in cybersecurity. Um, so I am part of the Cyber NYC team, which is our cybersecurity ecosystem development initiative. Let's give, let's give one more uh, sound check to uh, Kristen over there. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, Hi. Can you hear you? Hi, good afternoon. There we go. I'll sign off from here then. <laughs> Thank you so much for filling in and my, my apologies. Um, I don't know, but you never know, right? That's what we're going to talk through today. So I don't want to interrupt the, the flow of our distinguished panelists, but just a warm thank you to City and State for hosting um, this panel. Uh, the entire summit has been one of reckoning, of, of learning, and I think you can't learn unless you listen. And so if there's anything that I'm grateful for in this virtual environment is that there are so many opportunities to learn, right? The, the, the information is at our fingertips. And so today the panel is, you know, well-prepared, um, complete breadth of, of SME um, that they're going to share, um, you know, on, on cybersecurity and keeping um, us all safe. In our, in our new environment. So I'll, I'll let the flow continue for intros, but thanks for the sound check here. So Justin, do we wanna to go to you? Sure, absolutely, thanks, Kristen. Uh, Justin McDonald, I'm the executive security strategist here at CDW. I've got over 25 years experience of ITNS experience, and then have spent over the past decade in the InfoSec and cybersecurity uh, world. And I've uh, been privileged enough to work with some of the best cyber experts from the FBI, Secret Service, Homeland Security. And I recently came over from the large, one of the largest global uh, digital forensics and incident response firms, where I personally uh, worked hundreds of ransomware cases. So pleasure and thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Justin. All right, Colin? Uh, hi, I'm Colin Hearn. I'm the Deputy Chief Information Security Officer for the City of New York. I help to lead an organization called New York City Cyber Command, which prevents, detects, responds, and recovers from cyber threats against city systems and provides tools so that residents, visitors, and businesses can lead safer lives online. I'm also an adjunct associate professor at the Columbia School of International Public Affairs, where I specialize in cybersecurity technology and cyber resilience. Thanks, thanks, Colin, for being here. I, um, I'm glad you brought up your experience as a professor. I think there's just such a um, such an opportunity to continue to teach. So that's not easy to have a job and then take a second professor job as well uh, for bandwidth. But I just wanted. To, I was so glad you brought that up in your bio. I was uh, thankful for that. Okay, and I sorry I did miss who went first. I think we have Jack and Alex to go. Unless they already went. Jack, did you want to go? Calling a Kristen, if you want to come off mute. My name is Jack Green. Uh, I'm a partner at Carter Ledger to Milburn, uh, where I lead a team of lawyers to provide advice on uh, the legal requirements around cybersecurity and data privacy. Um, there are a patchwork of laws that apply in this area, and um, we help clients in individuals, companies, public sector figure out what applies, uh, what they need to do in order to uh, comply with the law and to think about the laws that are coming down the pike and um, how they can avoid having to do rush work uh, in the future in order to comply with the, uh, the laws we know are coming. I'm really glad to be part of this panel and honored to be among this group. Well, thanks, Jack. I think it's always better when we're prepared too, or at least have an effort of preparedness instead of uh, being reactive. So thanks for your contributions. Looking forward to the conversation. And I believe we'll round it out um, with Alex. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Alex Kirk. Uh, I have spent the last 17 years as a commercial open source security specialist, uh, working first uh, as a researcher uh, with SourceFire doing intrusion detection, 
uh, writing malware signatures, that sort of thing. Um, and then <clears throat> following on with time um, as a field implementation engineer at Cisco and Tenable uh, prior to the couple of uh, years that I've spent now here at Corelight uh, as our uh, global principal engineer. So I'm really here to represent the, the technology side uh, of, of the house. Good to have you here. And um, Justin and I, um, you know, our teammates at CDW, so thank you for your partnership, um, you know, as well in this space. Um, so before we, you know, hop into it, I think, you know, I don't think I've had a conversation this year where someone hasn't ended, be safe be well, right? Or that's kind of how we've all gotten off of Zoom or, or if you've met in person on a coffee of be well. So um, I think as we look at today's panel, we think, you know, the threat is particularly acute, you know, in a global economic hub, just like New York City, where, where we are today. And so with trillions of dollars, financial assets, more multi-billion dollar media companies than any other, so many small businesses at high risk. Um, we know that there is, such a potential for cyber attacks and, and cyber versions. And so that's what we're really gonna dive into today, uh, looking at the economy in New York City. But I, I just, you know, when I was preparing for this and, and reading uh, about all of you, it's like, no, I have literally not had a conversation where they haven't said be safe. So how do we be safe in this new environment, right? We are now digitized more than ever. Um, and, and what does, you know, the next six months look like? I think we're still writing that chapter for sure, but. Um, I know everyone, you know, listening and who tuning in, um, you know, is eager to hear, how do we stay safe collectively? How do we keep our assets safe? How do we keep our finances safe? How do we keep, um, you know, organizations safe as well? And so, you know, we'll lean into that today. So, Jack, I thought I would, you know, start with you. Um, you know, I, I wanted to see if you would be able to share you know, what what are some of the, the legal consequence, consequences excuse me of you know when a hacker does access when we aren't in that position of safety when they are able to access personal or confidential information and it becomes that dark web I can say you know that dark web is kind of a uh, uh, anomaly to me but what, what does that look like what's your experience and what would you share as any legal developments coming in the pipeline for for New York as we approach this uh, well, Kristen, thanks. That's a uh, that's a great question that hits on a lot of the key legal issues that uh, affect this space. I mean, the probably the number one issue that everyone turns to when there is a breach is the uh, the requirement, and this is the, one of the few legal requirements that exists to notify the people affected. Um, we all are used to shopping and interacting with um, all sorts of companies, including government agencies. And we have to provide a lot of personal information in order to get services. Um, we click through privacy policies without thinking about it. Um, and while in theory, you can have a claim for breach of those policies, really what you're required, what the companies are required to do is notify you. This applies also to government agencies as well. And that notification has to be prompt, it has to be complete, and it has to be um, within a reasonable period of time um, unless there's an ongoing um, uh, criminal investigation or a, a law enforcement investigation. So it's often because of these laws that we even hear about breaches because of this requirement that uh, affected individuals be notified. The second area of legal requirements I think that people should think about is in the cyber area, particularly for financial institutions, insurance companies, banks, there are legal requirements and regimens um, that require uh, these companies to take reasonable steps in order to protect information against expected attacks. Now, because the law is not good and shouldn't be too specific because technology is always changing, these laws are phrased in terms of what's reasonable, what can be expected, and they're, they're, they're really requiring companies to set up systems and processes to create a CISO function and then empower that person. I serve as a CISO for my law firm, for example, and it's really important that we, uh, every organization, think hard about whether they have actually taken steps to set up processes and procedures and then educate people on them. The law does require uh, all of us to do that. Looking forward, um, New York uh, State 
is considering enacting a comprehensive privacy regimen that would create much uh, stricter requirements for getting opt-in to use and share information, much stricter requirements on disclosures to what's done with personal information along the lines of what states like California, Virginia, Colorado, and the European Union have done. And so when I'm counseling clients about this, really my headline is don't read the law and think about what you need to do today. Uh, read what is happening in the news and read what other jurisdictions are doing and imagine what your company should be doing in five years when you live in a world where people really have more of a property interest in their own personal data. And how are you gonna, how are you gonna honor the rights that your consumers and customers have in that data by giving them the right to change it, to access it, and to know what you've done with it? Uh, Kristen, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. I would probably say, now I'm like hypersensitive around it. I would probably say that I, for one, um, am a click thrower. Like you said, we click through the things to move to the next page. And so um, I definitely, I wrote that down. But I, I loved what you said of how do we treat our personal data like personal property? That will stick with me for a while. So, um, so thanks for that comment and walking through. Um, you know, what's ahead and, and what consequences could look like. Um, thank you. So, so Justin, I, I, I wanted to see if we could turn to you as, as we look through, move from some legality, um, you know, and consequential things to what can you say have been some of the, the learnings you've had about just the overall threat landscape, right? Before we even get to legality, I guess, what does that landscape look like? What are some best practices we can do to do that just be safe, like we kind of talked through. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kristen. Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, we all know that ransomware continues to grow every day. Uh, the ransomware payments are increasing dramatically as well. And, you know, someone I saw in one of the chats about working remotely since the pandemic, that has been, you know, really a field day for threat actors because, you know, two things is one, the perimeter has changed instead, instead of just protecting your fortress, you now have a remote workforce that's working remotely with, you know, no security tools or very limited security tools. Um, and so, you know, and all like many of my cases, um, last couple of years, the, a lot of the targets have been states, municipalities, and also school districts. So I've worked a ton of those over the past uh, few years, along with healthcare. And, but, you know, the threat actors, you know, some of these are billion dollar organizations. Um, may, they make it easy and accessible for people to go out and buy ransomware kits for uh, low prices. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, working with organizations is a lot of time they're like, you know, we didn't think we'd be the next target. Um, you know, we're only a $50 million business. And, um, you know, I can tell you, it doesn't matter what size you are, enterprise to SMB space, everyone's, you know, could be a potential victim. Um, the other thing is, you know, incident response plans, you know, organizations that, you know, think they have really good incident response plans. Some organizations don't have incident response plans. And I talked to one organization the other day that said that they store their IR plan on their SharePoint, which if the network's down, they're not going to have access to any of the contacts that they really need to get in, involved with. Um, and they also um, didn't realize this, um, the real impact it had on the business. I mean, we look at ransomware cases, you know, uh, the averages organizations are down to 10 to 12 days. You know, what impact does that have on their business? And, you know, what I, how I kind of look at it is obviously products and services are great. There's no silver bullet. We all know that. Um, but, I look at it as organizations really should be focused on, you know, more of a uh, security strategy, an overall strategy for all business units to buy in on and to work towards building out that overall strategy. The second thing is uh, security as a culture is really developing and implementing that as a culture to, you know, not only education and cybersecurity awareness training for employees, but get employees to be able to, you know, what, what's most important to them is their children, their uh, families, 
um, and getting them to actually implement those security measures at home. Though, so then they translate that back to the workspace. Um, you know, so that's really important. You know, I, I had a meeting with the FBI a few weeks ago, and one of the one of the big points that they said is, you know, patch management and OS upgrades needs to be done immediately. I know that's hard for a lot of IT organizations to implement that that quick, but they said that's a huge risk. Uh, risk management, asset management, um, identity and access uh, management as well. Um, you know, admin rights. You know, kind of mapping out from an uh, organization who has access to critical controls, to, um, who has access to critical systems or finance or any of those things, and do they need them? If I'm Bob, an engineer, do I need to have access to those? Um, application whitelisting, um, but one of the critical ones is, is backups and being able to recover from backup. And that's one of the big ones, because if you can recover from backup during a ransomware, that, that's going to put you in a very good situation not to have to negotiate with the terrorist. Um, network segmentation, and the last one I'll kind of stop with is uh, MFA, multi-factor authentication, especially from a work, you know, remote workforce. I think that needs to that happen. But, you know, during my experience, you know, I've seen from all the different malware that's being launched every day. But over the past two years, it seems to be a lot of TrickBot, Ryuk, uh, Emotet, Botnet, and then some of the healthcare cases I've worked. Uh, that's Maze, which is more of a uh, credential uh, hunting to where they're pulling PHI information and holding that as ransom. So, you know, I, I just think, I think going back is, um, yes, it's great to have uh, great products and technologies, as we've seen on the news. It's not going to you know, keep you safe. It's more of the policy procedures and the overall security strategy. Thanks, Justin. I, I took a few notes. I love that you said security is a culture. You know, I think... Um, that we've also had, you know, uh, conversations so much about diversity, inclusion, and DEI, and workforce, and it's not a it shouldn't be a response to a crisis, but a culture, right? And so it just made me think of that when you said security is is a culture. Um, I also wrote down personally when you said, "What does security look like at home?" Right? And how does that translate to the workforce? Because I have a ten and twelve year old TikToking, so I don't know what I'll have to look at our security. I don't know what to, I gotta look at that. I will do that tonight. I wrote it down. Um, but yeah, what does it look like at home, and how do you translate, um, you know, to the workforce? And so, I did have one clarifying question, or if anyone wants to to jump in on Justin, you talked about, you know, the IR plan. Are you suggesting maybe have an IR plan, or should that be replaced with a security strategy, or good to have both? And of course, welcome, you know, anyone from the panel too. But go ahead, Justin. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely have both. And I recommend, you know, not only having an IR plan, but actually running through a tabletop exercise. And again, you know, that should include all stakeholders that should include outside counsel that should include your PR firm that should include your partners, your executive teams, it should include all business stakeholders that you know when something happens so I recommend that everyone prints out their IR plan and with the contacts of all those different uh, organizations and partners and actually keep a copy at home and keep a copy at work. Thanks for the clarity. Alex, did you want to jump in here? Sorry, one thing that I wanted to say to that is that a, a security policy and, and set of procedures really does align well with a good IR plan. Um, because fundamentally, when you're doing incident response, you're going to need to rely on a set of processes that were in place before that incident occurred. Um, and you know, some, some of the very fundamental things that we think about from an IR perspective are things that are somewhat neglected by the industry still. Asset management and visibility is kind of a key point in a lot of organizations that, you know, they're, they're scanning things actively once every 30 days and, and maybe mishmashing some endpoint data into a SIM and getting, you know, 50 to 75% coverage of their assets at best. Um, and, you know, if you don't realize that somebody has, has plugged in a, a home VPN concentrator to the network, um, to enable some sort of a remote work scenario, then you don't realize that that is a, a vector for exploitation by ransomware actors that they can, you know, drop into your network and go with. Um, and, you know, that problem is, is becoming particularly acute as we distribute throughout the cloud and remote workforce and, and all the, the modern trends 
uh, that are out there. And, and while, you know, I don't think that anyone necessarily, again, has that silver bullet for getting asset visibility across all of those places, um, that sort of strategy um, and, and having as much telemetry as you can have about what is taking place between these assets, you know, what kind of software is on them, what they're vulnerable to, et cetera, is, is all going to be very informative when you do discover that incident and you're able to, to kind of go back and deconstruct how somebody got in, what actually occurred once they got in. Um, you know, to, to Jack's point about disclosure, um, if you don't understand the scope of what actually occurred during an incident because you lacked that fundamental visibility into your network to start with, you're going to have a real hard time complying with, you know, requests for disclosure. Um, and so really all these things are, are wrapped up into a broader process. Um, and, and, you know, to the point of think about where you need to be in five years, uh, I think that's been a big problem that the industry has had. There's been a lot of reactionary sort of, I got to go purchase this point product right now because of a, a gap that's been identified by, you know, an incident or a tabletop exercise or whatever. And there's less coherent strategic planning about capability sets and interaction between all of these different data sets and vendor technologies to, to bring a coherent process to bear against security. Um, Kristen, if I can just build on that with a small, but I think important legal point. I mean, the, the time and attention and resources that an organization puts into doing tabletop exercises and, and drafting real meaningful uh, incident response plans and uh, security protocols is very important if there is a later breach that happens notwithstanding all the planning because if a stakeholder, an investor, a consumer brings a lawsuit because of damages, and this happens with almost every major breach, the fact that the organization did take these steps and did try take reasonable steps to avoid having these things happen is a very important part of the defense of any action. Thank you both for, for adding. I definitely took down um, some notes um, of things, things to look at. You know, I um, there so much legality and, and what's at risk and what's at stake. I wanted to see Colin if we could turn a little bit on um, you know the the critical work you do for the city, but the economic mobilization that your organization is working to. You know, when I was looking at your organization, something that just really stood out is you know we. By implementing strategies, you know, for Cyber NYC, we aim to spur the creation of 10,000 cybersecurity jobs. You know, we're looking for all stakeholders, uh, workforce, you know, through a hundred million dollar suite of public-private investment. You know, I and I think where we are today in 2021 and where we want to go, we want to see economic mobilization. We want planes taking off again, school buses coming through the road. I know I do want that school bus to show up. We want things to to start happening again. So could you just walk through? some of the, the economic improvements and about the important work you're doing. Yeah, and before I, I kick it over to uh, the EDC, uh, a couple of things to mention. One is that high performing teams are diverse teams and high performing teams are teams with a lot of psychological safety. Uh, so it's a, you know, cybersecurity is a team sport and it's one that an individual contributor, a line one SOC tier one analyst at three in the morning is gonna be the one that's either gonna feel like they can bring a problem, wake up the boss and prevent a bad event from being a very bad event or not. Uh, so DEI and, and respecting each other in the organization's culture are fundamental to security outcomes. Uh, so kind of mentioning that at the top, I think is important. Two of the things we've done obviously in close collaboration with EDC, uh, who I think should speak right after this and, and actually NYU and several other stakeholders uh, is a talent pipeline for, for the city. This, the uh, unemployment rate in cybersecurity is essentially zero. There's a huge deficit of cybersecurity talent all over the world and not just in New York City. Uh, so we're building relationships with academia, uh, with the City University of New York, with you know, the top tier research universities within the five boroughs, uh, Cornell Technion, NYU, et cetera. Uh, and we think that non-traditional hires are gonna be an increasingly important part of the cybersecurity workforce. 
Um, and so we're doing things like the Cyber Strike Challenge with NYU, uh, where we bring in people on nights and weekends uh, to work on the city's cyber range uh, and other things like that. Uh, and I think maybe um, uh, Zevion probably should uh, just talk about some of the incredibly important things her team is doing as well. Sure, not a problem. Thanks, Colin. Um, no, I agree with everything that Colin just said. Um, with Cyber NYC, uh, it's an incredibly timely focus on cybersecurity, but it originated actually before the pandemic. So around 2018 as part of the uh, mayor's push for creating 100,000 jobs in emerging industries across the city, everything from not just cybersecurity, but everything including um, AI, blockchain, um, media and entertainment, fashion, um, VR, the goal being to look at industries that not only are in really challenging, interesting sectors, but also would allow for economic growth for New Yorkers. Um, in the case of Cyber NYC, the program was created as a way of supporting uh, the growth of the ecosystem as a whole in New York City, but with a uh, with the understanding that as the ecosystem grew, it would be ideal if it actually reflected the diversity of New York City. As we are all aware, and frankly, as this panel somewhat reflects, um, cybersecurity is very much a white male area with, I think the latest numbers are 14% um, female participation, um, 3% African-American. So the question being, how do we, how does the city engage and ensure that as the, uh, I believe 30,000 unfilled jobs in the New York City metropolitan area are uh, trained for, um, how do you make sure that a broad swath of New Yorkers are engaged in that in, in that promise? Um, so in programmatically, the way we approached it was twofold. One, looking at the demand side for labor, um, trying to work with partners, for example, Jerusalem Venture Partners on um, our growth stage accelerator, which had its cohort uh, last year, um, virtual due to the pandemic, um, as well as engaging with SOSA um, out of Israel to put on programming that would um, not only foster talent by connecting um, entrepreneurs in the cybersecurity space with mentorship, but to also have programming for the general public to make them more aware of opportunities in cybersecurity. Um, this was sort of, you know, broad ranging programs for folks who had no idea what cybersecurity was to, for example, um, jobs fairs with our, part, with our academic partners like um, CUNY, um, LaGuardia in particular. Um, so that's, uh, and then of course, um, as Colin mentioned previously, our academic partnerships with um, trying to create more of a, uh, a tighter touch point between the academic side, um, in this case, uh, partners from Columbia, NYU, and CUNY, those university affiliates, and then bring research into a commercialized space um, with the support of the city through a early stage um, accelerator. Um, on the supply side for, um, for uh, our workforce, we looked at, we, we tried to answer the question of how is it that you can engage folks no matter where they are in terms of their, um, their understanding of cybersecurity. So whether you have a high school degree or whether you are um, an IT professional or uh, in one case, uh, an Uber driver, um, or somebody who is mid-career and looking for a change. And so we had several programs, um, for example, the um, Stackable Credentialing Program with NYU that would allow current professionals to switch over and really just gain skills and expertise that met them where they are. Um, and at present, um, our more sort of like entry level focus on um, our partnership with Full Stack Cybersecurity, um, I'm sorry, Full Stack Academy, um, standing up the cybersecurity bootcamp. Um, that particular project uh, graduated about 103 um, New Yorkers um, and the city as a result of COVID-19 announced an additional um, partnership that is currently funding um, some 29 students. 
um, so long as they have a high school diploma can show that they are um, in need of financial assistance to uh, to engage in the boot camp and have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. Um, the city has decided to fund uh, the entirety of the $17,000 um, tuition for them to attend uh, the boot camp, uh, which is effectively a 17 week uh, program on the full time side, 26 weeks on the part time side. Um, and at the end of it, uh, these folks will be will be certified to engage in the work of um, security operations center analysts, um, as well as penetration testers. Um, so that's basically where we are. I think the overall, I guess, the overall thought that we have, uh, the overall philosophy is really that if the pandemic has shown anything, um, besides how vulnerable everyone is as we migrate our social, economic, and um, every other aspect of our lives online, uh, how vulnerable all of that is to cybersecurity, how the question is how can we frame um, engagement in cybersecurity as not only a fantastic job prospect, but an act of service um, and something that will help New Yorkers as a whole um, and really just the industry to develop in a more sustainable and diverse way. I am so overwhelmed with all of your stats. So just what a booming, successful program. I would just say congratulations to both of you. And uh, you can tell the collaboration where you were leaning into each other. That's, that's such good role modeling. And, um, you know, 103 at full tuition. I can see like Justin, Jack, Alex smiling because they're like, okay, that's a talent pipeline. CDW is hiring, partners are hiring, right? We are looking for the next best. Um, but thank you for continuing education um, and investing in that and seeing that through. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful, you know, for that work. And I, I think Walt said an act of service. So, um, so thank you for that, both of you. You know, I think, um, I love when these aren't planned this way, but on an act of service, I, I feel compelled to talk to, to Wolf from right of the FBI and uh, just always a huge gratitude uh, for, for your work and your organization. But uh, Wolf, I, I would, you know, welcome you, you know, in to share, you know, your perspective on, um, you know, what you've heard today, but then also kind of in my research, you know, I was, I was looking at, you know, the National Cybersecurity Summit, you know, and some comments there that we have to change the cost benefit calculus of criminals and national states who believe they can compromise. U.S. networks, and I'm just wondering if you can, you know, elaborate on what you're seeing in, in your lens um, today, tomorrow, in the future. Sure, thank you. Um, I think, um, you know, really, I would reflect um, a couple of things that have already really been mentioned by the panelists, both in this panel and previously um, in earlier this afternoon. Um, I guess you know, focusing the, the two words that come to mind really, culture and education, are the ones that have been have been mentioned already. Um, so, by culture, I think, you know, I think we really have to adapt within the culture of law enforcement to to address cyber threats. And law enforcement tends to be resistant sometimes to that kind of immediate change. So. It, it needs to be it needs to be pushed, but we need to, to to change the culture and I think take some lessons. And this is already it's, it's already certainly happening. I think lessons that are have been learned from from earlier um, major disasters, as earlier panelists mentioned about, such as 9/11, that cyber investigations have have to be worked in a joint manner. Um, you can't have the you know, basically different agencies all pursuing separate investigations. So one thing that we have done, particularly in New York, is brought together, you know, local, state, and federal law enforcement all at the New York field office of the FBI to work in a task force environment. And I think that is um, going to be a, a, a bigger trend with more and more people kind of joining, hopefully, more agencies joining, obviously the more that join the better. 
um, and having that that local presence, obviously in New York, this is one of the probably the most important uh, task force in the country. Just the fact that we're able to communicate with city um, agencies directly when there's a threat to one of their networks makes it, it just makes a huge change in being able to not necessarily get ahead of an intrusion, but to, to address it and assess it in a much, in a much um, faster uh, manner. Um, I think, like I said, that uh, education is key and it's been mentioned in various different ways earlier. I mean, obviously there are um, you know, great, great steps. I, like was um, described with Zevian earlier, um, you know, actual education programs. I think the FBI can really help to kind of use its investigations to better educate people and companies, enterprises about the attacks that they're facing, um, as opposed to, you know, simply investigating to try to find the culprits, which is, is still obviously one of our objectives. Um, investigating the way the attacks work and the, and the types of vulnerabilities that are being targeted, and then communicating that information back to the public is part of that education that I think is, is pretty critical. Um, just a final point, I would, I would add that I don't have any specific numbers, but um, I think that the lack of of uh, female representation was brought up, and I can I can attest that in the New York office um, we're acutely aware that that's a problem. Um, we're aware of it. The, the representation is is much lower than, for example, if you look at the percentage even of FBI agents, the the male to female um, uh, ratio is somewhat lower than the population to begin with. When you look at cybersecurity, it's even lower than, than the actual ratio within the FBI itself. Um, so it's something that we are definitely aware of and we need to address. But I thought that was an interesting point that was brought up here. That's all. Thanks. Thanks both for, um, for all of that. I again took, um, you're right, it's a culture, it's workforce, it's working together, collaborating. I really appreciate you saying the more local we can get involved, the more awareness, just a true invitation to collaborate, right? Like silos are down and, and how do we work together? That's what you know. I really felt. And, um, and you're right, it's not every day on a live panel, we create our own use case uh, for, for diversity and what it looks like, but um, thank you for for you know, acknowledging that. And I think all of us can probably just be part of, you know, a promise of progress going forward, right? And that's what we can do. So, um, okay, so not, not getting too heavy, but moving on to, you know, you know Alex, your Corelight is just incredible, incredible platform to ensure, you know, the things that we've heard about keeping personal data safe and, um, breaches and having IR plans, you know, if you could walk us through, you know, what are platforms to give us the best sense of that, be safe, what, what are you seeing out there? Um, you know, what are, what are the deployments your team is, is you know, leaning into, levering on? Um, we just really love, you know, for you to round us out on, on what we can do better and what you see. Certainly, um, and, and one thing that I would speak to before the issue of, of tools and technologies is going back to process a bit. Um, one of the silos that we see all too commonly out in the wild is between network teams and security teams within organizations. The former having a, a focus on uptime and availability and the latter being the, the, the kings of no, so to speak, and the ones who come in and break things in, for, in the sake of security. Um, and really, I think that we need to be breaking down those walls as well organizationally to ensure that all departments within any given enterprise are, are aligned. Um, and you know, it, it, it speaks well to um, recognition of that fact that we're getting more alignment between you know, government entities. Um, the fact that the NSA actually just dropped an advisory on Chinese state-sponsored attacks and the techniques and methodologies being used in them on Tuesday um, is, is just more progress in us all coming together as defenders, um, you know, towards a common mission. 
Um, but you know, in, in terms of, of the technology landscape and, and how we can do better as an industry, um, you know, I think we've all kind of reached a point where we can agree on the SOC triad um, as a concept where you, you need endpoint data and network data then centralized in some sort of analytics platform where you can bring in threat intelligence, um, indicators of compromise, all those other things to, to take all the data that may come from your disparate systems and make actual knowledge and intelligence out of it. Um, and the, the one trend that I think is going to really help a lot of organizations is towards consolidation of what they're bringing into that, that base of knowledge. Um, because too many organizations have, you know, got dozens potentially of different point products within a security stack. Everyone has kind of gone with the defense in depth mentality of, you know, if this one detection technology doesn't find it, this one or this one or this one falling behind it might. Um, and fundamentally, I think as, as an industry, we need to shift towards fewer but higher quality data sources as we're informing our understanding of our environments, doing detections within them, being able to baseline for anomalies. Uh, because the last time that we're spending getting our tools to interoperate with each other, to adhere to open standards, um, to, to bring the tech together in the same way that we're bringing the people together, the better the chance that we can actually streamline um, a, a process that works in the vendor technologies that we've got in support of the organizational objectives that are going to make us secure at the end of the day. Thanks. So, thank you. I, I really have always appreciated and probably now more so the, the leaning into quality over quantity. And so, you know, thank you for bringing that, you know, to, to the force that I think we have two questions in the chat, but I, I just wanted to thank, you know, all of you personally and for everyone listening, you know, I, I think as I look back at my, my takeaways, I have a whole page here of, you know, of, treating our personal data like we do our personal property, Jack, that's like really hit home for me of, am you know, I protecting the same way um, and taking measures, psychological safety, right, is one that in all of this and that we're talking through and how, whether you're experienced or new to this field or segment, that that has to be at the forefront for all of us today um, to bring our best selves, you know, to the work. I love um, acts of service. I've leaned into that a lot. Uh, security, you know, it has to be a culture and then, you know, quality, you know, over quantity is really where we find ourselves today. So I just want to thank you um, for that. I think we have just a few minutes and I will open this up. We have a question from uh, a listener today. Are most cyber attacks a result of lone actors, organizations, or are they state-sponsored attacks? And I can feel free to come on mute. These are live questions. You want to take a stab at it? So at the risk of, of hogging the spotlight here, um, I, I would say that it's it's a lot less lone actors today um, than it is organized uh, activity. And while there's certainly a great deal of state-sponsored activity, again, leaning back to that NSA disclosure from earlier this week, um, there's a great deal of organized criminal enterprise as well. Um, a, a lot of the folks out there who were able to go buy a ransomware kit off the shelf and get 24 seven support to then go drop it on their victims, they wouldn't be able to do that without that you know, system behind them that does all of the coding and the, the infrastructure delivery um, that's necessary to evade modern detections. Um, so I think it's, it's our adversaries are getting more organized and that's why we as defenders need to do the same. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in or next question? Yeah, I think um, organized crime is probably, from a numbers perspective, a good reference point is a document called the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, which is a widely read industry publication. And I think if my talking points serve me well, 80% or so of the of reported breaches, so we're dealing with a known known and not <laughs> an unknown unknown, are organized crime. Uh, with state affiliated being something less than 5% of reported breaches. Uh, but you might describe that also the sophistication of state actors uh, and their ability to not be detected. But it seems clear even from the data we do have that organized crime uh, is far and away the most prevalent uh, threat to individuals and businesses and governments. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for the, the reference point of the report. Our viewers will definitely be able to take that as a, a tangible takeaway. Um, okay, in our in our 60 seconds, maybe we can all go around. Wolf, we'll start with you for our last our last question. And so the question from our listener is, in your opinion, what is the best way to educate the general public, children, seniors, adults, on cybersecurity hygiene? Not just staying safe, but risk. So if we all take uh, a go at this one, is that okay, Wolf, to start with you? Sure. Best way to educate. Um, the best way, I mean, there, there are a lot of different approaches. I, I think that one thing that we do in our office is we just try to, um, we, we have outreach to, um, to, uh, to public schools and to various organizations um, to try to teach young people about the various risks they, that they face online. And um, the, the earlier uh, panel, there was an issue brought up of, of language accessibility. And that's something that, you know, we have to, when you go out in the, in the New York public schools, we're trying to find, you know, agents who can speak various different languages to address the, yeah. the threats that kids face online. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, but that's, that's one way where the, that we're doing it is through those kinds of, um, those kinds of meetings. Um, you know, I think just, um, I, th I don't want, you know, people shouldn't, obviously you don't want to live their life sort of feeling paranoid, but just that understanding that truly everyone is, is, is at risk it's in some way, particularly, and we just see it through email and social media constantly. And just to be a little bit more careful where there's a lot of, seems like there's a lot of mislaid trust in some of those, um, some of those social networks. So um, just, I guess, just educating people and getting them to exercise more caution. Um, that's all. No, thanks. So I will tell you, when I go talk to my 10 and 12 year old, I'm taking their phones when I get home and I'm going to tell them I talk to the FBI and they tell me to check. So I'm going to do that. Um, okay. And then like a lightning round, Justin, did you want to share best way to, to educate for our listener? Yeah, I actually did this uh, with my son who decided he always liked to click on everything is uh, he has his, his uh, gaming PC. So one day I unplugged it and told him that since he had been clicking on things that he had uh, put malware into his system and then I'd fix it. And so but he had to wait over a week before I turned it back on and told him that's what happens when you click on things. So um, I think, you know, looking at the applications that they're using, you know, all their devices and try to relate that back to, you know, what happens if, you know, you can't play Xbox for a week or you can't jump on your, you know, play your games on your phones and, you know, just, just kind of from a basic elementary style of just really kind of having them understand, you know, the impact it has on them. And that's obviously that's a different impact, you know, that it has on them than it would us, but. Okay. Well, I love a diehard move. That's a diehard. All right. We're on a, a quick time thing. I think anyone want to share a last tad bit of how you would educate before we, you know, say goodbye to everyone listening. Best way to say educate. Um, yeah. I guess to sort of piggyback off of what Justin said, which was Absolutely hilarious and ruthless, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> my sympathies to your children, but well done. Um, I think that the main point is to meet people where they are. So asking the question, what do folks care about? In Justin's child's case, video games. But um, for other folks, it'll be financial data or whether or not they can access their, I don't know, church sermons without somebody um, what is it, Zoom bombing um, their conversations or just security of their academic records or their healthcare records. Like, I think it's just a matter of really thinking through who the population is, who the consumer of the information is, and then asking very concretely, what do they care about and how is that at risk? And then communicating that. I think so elegant, meet people where they're at, right? We can probably all I'll make a commitment to that. You know, thank you so much for the opportunity to have this conversation with all of you. I definitely walked away more educated and some to do's and I know our viewers did, but thank you for all the work that you're doing every day to really keep us safe. Um, and so thank you very much. And thank you to city and state. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Kristen, for moderating that great discussion.
It seems like uh, you folks could have just gone on and on. There's so much to talk about, really fascinating stuff. Uh, perhaps next year we'll have you back as the Fab Seven. It was that good. Uh, thank you all. Again, I'll give you a little clap from my apartment in lieu of audience applause. And that is going to do it for our event. That is the third and final discussion. Um, before I let you go, I just had a few things I wanted to throw out there. First of all, again, our beloved sponsors, we couldn't have done it without you. They include CDW, Berkeley College, Celebrite, Data Miner, Carter, Ledyard, and Milburn, Core Light, Inc., Splunk, and S. WAC, Secure Worker Access Consortium. Thank you so much. We're so grateful for you helping us to put on this great event. And let's keep the conversation going. Please join us on Wednesday, July 28th at 5 p.m. as we honor our Bronx Power 100. Registration is free and can be found on our website, cityandstateny.com, and in the chat function just below. And then on Wednesday, August 11th at 5 p.m., we're going to Kings County. Yes, it's our Brooklyn Power 100. Registration is free and can be found on our website and in the chat. Again, that website is city and spelled out state ny like new york.com and then on august on tuesday august 17th it's our annual education summit at 1 p.m is registration free you betcha it can be found right on our website and in the chat again thank you to all of our sponsors if you haven't signed up already i strongly recommend you go to our website and sign up for first read keep you updated every morning and evening with what's going on in new york city and state politics i'm zach williams senior state politics reporter for city and state catch you next time